All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. Uh, this week, we're going to uh, give you uh, the Q&A that we did back in March of 2019 during Sin Week. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, we ha- just hadn't had a good place to actually put it until now. Yeah. And uh, we thought this would be something uh, good for you guys to listen to. Yeah. And uh, we thought it was awesome. So- it was. Sin Week is a, a time for us and the people that that support us and that are fans and everything to get together on location in Nashville as of March. And yeah, had a panel where uh, the three of us and then our coworkers, Aaron Dicer and Jonathan Watkins just answered questions. And it turned out the, 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 the members had awesome questions and it was really funny. Yeah. It was really fun. Yeah. So you get, you get to enjoy that now. And if you want to be a part of this, I don't know why I'm looking psychotic right now. That's okay. Mm-hmm. But if you if you want to be a part of this in 2020, mm-hmm. you can. Yeah. Barrett, Barrett is currently looking psychotic. Yeah. 2020, do Sin we, Week. Do we want to tell them the dates? Yes. March. <laughs> <laughs> do we want to look at the screen to find out the dates? What an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mar- uh, March 12th through 14th. 2020 lousy smart weather <laughs> lousy smart weather uh in nashville tennessee you can come to sin week and be a part of this celebration we're going to do all kinds of fun things including more panels live podcasts if you are a member of our patreon at that time uh you also have access to like extra videos and all kinds of stuff during that week mm-hmm. it was a blast in 2019 and i can't i can't wait for it to happen again you'll pay for the whole seat but you'll only need the edge <laughs> <laughs> Boom! <laughs> so yeah enjoy the q a it's a lot of fun welcome to sincast presented by cinema sins hey everybody this is <laughs> Welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins. Joined as always by the voice of CinemaSins, Jeremy Scott. That's me. And from Music Video Sins, Barrett Share. Hello. And also joining us, CinemaSins, Aaron Dicer and Jonathan Watkins. Hello. Hello. Hello, Cinerinos. Uh, and we are going to be doing some questions and answers. One of those Q&A type deals. I want the truth. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Questions. We've got these beautiful people here for Sin Week in Nashville, Tennessee. We talked to God... And we dialed up this weather for you guys, mm-hmm. so it's you're so welcome. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, and we want to talk to you guys and ask us anything um, within reason. Well, Not you how can to spell ask anything. Nietzsche. We don't have to yeah, answer. Yeah, that's, that's true. true. <laughs> Jeremy will probably answer whatever you ask. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and yeah. We've got viewers online, right, at home? Yeah, we've got, we're monitoring the Discord, we're monitoring the, uh, the YouTube chat, and of course we've got people in the room uh, who have... You know, throwing a couple questions here and can also come to the microphone. So, um, and I think we, you know, when, if you're up here, you'll be on camera. So, just so you know that, there are other people watching uh, your beautiful faces as well. So, mm-hmm. well, and I think theoretically we would have time. If every one of you wanted to ask a question, we would have time to answer them. Absolutely. So, I don't think we need to line up like 13 people no, deep at the microphone no, just... so people's views are blocked and whatnot. Yes. All right, bring us the cues. Who's got a cue? Come on. Who's, All right. Come on. First to the mic. Who's, who's coming with me? Mm. Who's coming? Mm. There you go. Story. There's a there's a brave soul <laughs> headed to the microphone. Tell us your name and where you're from. Uh, Mike McGinnis from San Antonio, Texas. Wow, Very nice. Hello. awesome. Welcome. So this is a question for everybody. If you could force another person on the panel to watch a movie they have not yet watched, either because you think they would enjoy it or just to get entertainment out of it, what would it be? Personally, I think Jeremy would really enjoy Perks of Being a Wallflower, and based on previous podcasts, he has not watched it yet, and I think that's a movie he would enjoy. So I'm curious what. Your guys' answers will be. I have not question. seen that movie. Is that true? I should really listen. You to may this be podcast. right about that. Because <laughs> I would definitely make you watch Bergson. Uh, That's a great. What, movie. what is that movie? Is there a movie you refuse to watch that we that people try to get you to watch? And it would be the that would be the answer. I mean, right? yeah, the only ones that I like refuse to watch are like Gone with the Wind, just shit that I'm being stubborn about. Um, you you said I, I wouldn't force Love Actually on you, but you, I know Thank that you. I know that you Thank didn't you. want to watch that or anything. So I'm, I'm trying to think of a, a, another movie that you. I've might. still never seen The Room. Oh yeah, yeah. I wouldn't force that on you either. Okay, so it has to be yeah. a movie. You're forcing it on someone, but it, it has to be because you think they'll love it. Yes. Uh, Did you ever watch The Rookie? That's different. I have not. 
That would be Ooh, mine for Chris. Because okay. Chris is a baseball guy and a baseball movie guy. You've seen the Dennis Quaid movie, The Rookie? I love that movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think it would hit the, the baseball vibe. Yeah. Chris. Okay. That's what I think. All right. And it's got that little kid from Two and a Half Men before he became obnoxious when he's still really little. John Cryer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, hey, Barrett, have you still not seen Maltese Falcon? I still have not. I that, actually that, that would I be mine. own the Maltese yeah. Falcon, and I still haven't seen it. That would definitely be mine. You need to watch Maltese Falcon. I would make Barrett watch Maltese it. Falcon. That's yeah. one of my all-time favorite movies. You two over here probably have seen more movies than all of us. I, I, I don't know my, about uh, you. If, if you're going over the last few years when I've been a movie critic, maybe, but before that, no way. Oh, okay. You guys are much more literate. You know, pre my movie critic days than I am. Okay, so, so I, I wouldn't have a hard time trying to figure out a movie that you haven't seen. That uh, you know. well, and we also, you know, we also don't chat every week about movies with you guys. So you're more unaware, I think, of the ones we haven't. Probably, seen. Probably, yeah. Um, uh, I want Jeremy to see Bodied. I like. I am so anxious to hear what Jeremy has to say oh, about yeah, Bodied. That'd be a good one. Um, so that's that's probably. I only have answer. a very 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 bad reason for not having seen it. You're mad at YouTube. I'm mad at YouTube. It's a, it's a YouTube Red movie. And I, I don't want to pay him. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you sign up for the free month. What's, what's on you guys' list that you haven't seen that I would maybe tell you you need to see? Um, probably, probably stuff like classic stuff like Kurosawa stuff or Kubrick stuff. There's a few of those on my list that... I haven't I, gone around yeah, to. Yeah, I have. I've never seen Seven Samurai. That's one that. Me either. And I own it. That's a, that's one I own, and I've mm. never watched it. Aaron, what Kubrick movies haven't you seen? I mean, name. You're the Kubrick guy, right? Like name name Starting the movies. With low, well, Pass of Glory and stuff like that. No, I haven't seen that. 2001. Lolita. I've seen 2001. I haven't Clockwork seen. Orange. I haven't seen Lolita. I haven't seen Clockwork Orange. You Killing. haven't seen Clockwork Orange. Mm-mm. No, I haven't. Um, hey, I don't know. Uh, let's stop like it right that. here. Clockwork Orange is not for everybody. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, that's I think a, I think Aaron would really like. Have you seen The Killing? Uh, I don't think so. Oh yeah, you would definitely. Yeah, like, so you that, would really. Like that's that one of those one. that you would just super dig for sure. Barry Lyndon is great. Um, yeah, Clockwork Orange is on Netflix now. By the way, um, it's weird because the exercise is one that you think they would get a lot of enjoyment out of, and I don't think you could ever say that about the Clockwork Orange. <laughs> I get enjoyment out of watching it just because of the. The, the the cinematic nature of it, not necessarily the story or the rooting for the characters or anything yeah. like that. I just think that it's presented in such a way that's utterly unique, even for Kubrick. Uh, and I, it's it's an indescribable movie. If I if I told you the plot right now, it would not do the movie justice. Yeah. So, um, I would suggest that you no, it's on my list. Gird your it's... loins and watch it. <laughs> Consider my loins girded. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and what Jeremy's getting at is that A Clockwork Orange has a lot of stuff in it that is, you know, is borderline, if not totally abhorrent in it. Um, Absolutely. And uh, and so it's 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 that type of thing. You don't you don't necessarily want to see that, even if there's a point behind behind mm-hmm. it. A lot of times, so that's not a movie I would force on him mm-hmm. by any means. But <laughs> no, that would be. Is it, that's, a, that's appropriate. I was going to say, wouldn't that be ironic? <laughs> <I know, yeah. laughs> I know enough about plastic orange to get it would, that. It would, be, it would be me with a giant yeah. plastic cock that's hitting you with it. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and this is so random, but Jeremy, have you seen Tells from the Hood? No. I, would, I think that would be a Jeremy movie. I think so. I think you know, I, even though it's a horror movie, man, I think you would just love. It's that like movie. comic horror, right? Yeah, yeah. It's Rusty Coon Death. Did you ever see Fear of a Black Hat? Yeah, directed that. It's okay. the same director. Okay, it's it's fun little game I play with the podcast, listening to the syncast, where I, I come in for the year end stuff, right, and we talk about all these movies, and then I patiently wait throughout the year for Jeremy to finally watch something, <laughs> and then talk about it on the podcast when it comes on stars. Yeah, yeah. Or something <laughs> like that. And then he'll so. watch it ten times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That is correct. <laughs> I'm also anxious for your opinion on First Man, which I haven't heard anything from. That you is yet. correct. So <laughs> it is, it, I have watched MacGruber again instead. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Um, I want I want to force MacGruber on everyone. I've seen yeah. it, and, I, and uh, not just in a because I know Barrett saw it, but that was a long time ago. It was, and I think it has gained a cult status since it then. Yes. And I think it could be worth. And it gets better the more you watch it. It really does. One of those movies. Yeah. Um, But I still don't know if it's great. 
But I love it. Oh, it's my And I would it's force you to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then you're on deck. See, I thought it was just Q and A. That's one Q. Mm-hmm. One A. Yeah, no. mm-hmm. Q's and A's. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So y'all are pretty tight now. But I'm let's... sorry, name and where you're from. Oh, my name is Blake Hodges, <laughs> and I'm from Nashville about 10 minutes away. Nice. Um, so let's rewind time. You're, do we have any good, between any of y'all, first impression stories that were kind of funny? And if not first impressions, kind of like that first month or two where you're getting to know someone where you're like, oh, now I know who this person is hmm. now. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess Aaron is is the one person out of this group that has more of this kind of experience because I've known Jonathan for 25 years. Mm-hmm. I've known Jeremy now 20 years, and I've known Barrett almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were first impressions back then. Yeah, too, I'll tell you. About. I'll tell you straight up. I hated Barrett when I first <laughs> met him. Straight up. There was something about what. <laughs> <laughs> what? I didn't hear that. She said, I believe it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, there was an aloofness that he had that I was just like, I couldn't crack this this guy. I was like, man, what, what's going on? Like, you know, I didn't like, I, I say I hate him. I didn't hate him, hate him. But I was just like, I just don't think we could ever be friends because it's just the way you were. I don't yeah. know what it was. Um, Jeremy, I actually don't remember too much about our first meetings because we were work people at first and just yeah. sort of... Um, co-workers but uh, but then we started watching movies together and stuff like that and mystery science theatering a lot of stuff and um, annoying all the people who would watch the same movie with us on Thursday I think nights. we started initially bonding because we were basically the only two managers up in the booth that gave a damn mm-hmm. about like good projection yeah yeah <laughs> like, yeah like everybody else was either a union projectionist which is basically the jets and the sharks or yeah. a manager that didn't give a shit. And so I think the first year or two of working together, it was just that, hey, those guys over there are lazy fuckers. Let's mm-hmm. go fix their mistakes. Yeah. Uh, and then it kind of morphed into that. Yeah, we'd, we'd watch. You build a movie. You have to watch it to make sure there's not mistakes. That is not the case anymore. I feel really bad for movie theater employees. Because we yeah. used to have to. It used to be, I used to get paid to watch the movie to make sure there wasn't a scratch. Well, and also, they've restricted it for a lot of people yeah. to watch movies on Thursday night because yeah. they keep track of how many times that movie gets watched. Yeah. Because so they're crazy. assholes. Yeah. It's like they have a, like, oh, well, yeah, we, we're not going to let you watch this past 10 o'clock. And if you do, be sure it's an official uh, showing because that's uh, it's an unauthorized showing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically, piracy, you're going to jail. Yeah. Well, and every, everything opens on Thursday now. Yeah, I mean they have showings of everything on Thursday. Well, now, yeah, so which it, would that mean become Wednesday, I guess. Which would mean Wednesday. Yeah. I mean we we had we had movies that came in on Wednesdays too. Uh, we usually but, actually Wednesday became the go to night. Thursday we said yeah. Thursday night as a sort of shorthand, but Wednesday but, became. But a, I mean you're but you're not really having to check prints anymore either, right? No, so that's, that's, right. that's yeah. yeah, that's not. You really, don't have to watch it to make sure so everything's cool. That's probably cool why. Because, yeah, that sucks though. Because that's yeah. part of the fun of working at a theater. Well, they still do it. Yeah. I know the theaters where I'm at. So because oh, they do at ours too. Yeah, they still do the night before for the staff and stuff. So well, yeah, maybe. Uh, Jonathan was dating a girl that went to my high school, mm-hmm. and it, it was almost like he went to my high school because of that. I had a lot of friends from that high school. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I went to the prom there. And, uh, Twice. I just, yeah, I mean, most of, most of the things that you ever run, when, when you run into Jonathan, is like, hey, that guy's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. Well, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Um, and then, Aaron, I'm trying to remember the first time I actually met you. Was it at your house for the recording? Was that the first time we met? I think it was when I came over for the first time I did the podcast. I think I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. You are way taller than I thought you were. Yeah. Um, uh, that was the, that was my initial impression. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. The, uh, to, as to your character, your tallness. Which funny. Um, that's the first thing that I noticed about you. <laughs> oh, really? Well, like, Chris is super tall. Yeah, All well, right. I don't ever notice tallness until someone is taller than me. Right. Like, I don't even know that I tower over most people. People until someone towers over me, and uh, now you know what it feels like, motherfucker. I do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Aaron's the same way; just a really nice guy, real jovial, and like you don't you don't feel judged. <laughs> oh, unlike Thank these you. two guys, right? I know. Yeah, so so uh, easy to talk to, and that's basically what uh, came out. In of college, that. Aaron and I bonded right away because we were both smarter than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, remember, um, do you remember when we met? No. I'm almost sure I know when we met. Okay, I don't remember this. Mr. What? ONU contest, our freshman year. Oh, that year. had to be it. Yeah, they did this ma- male comedy version of, like, a Miss USA at our college. <laughs> In hindsight, it's probably problematic. But uh, basically, we all did, like, speeches, and we all did, like, skit, skits. We had a talent. A talent and portion, and then we answered the a question. 
This was 1993. <laughs> so this was before yeah. superhero movies had done yeah. anything. But it was a superhero theme. I remember the yep. theme. Our first I was senior. glue guy. I was miscellaneous man. <laughs> 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 and so I just remember thinking, because they picked two guys from every year to participate, and then it's like a contest, and we were the two from the freshman class. Yep. And so I just remember bonding with you over that. Well, and, and I think the reason it came about was Josh Childs was a year ahead of us as a sophomore, right. and his talent was a video where he went back in time and killed all the other contestants. And we met, I think, filming our vignettes yep, for Josh's That's absolutely video. right, yeah. Um, and so we've been, we were the same major, we were both in the radio station, um, and both in communication classes, and so that developed pretty quickly after that, I think. Yeah, and then once we both loved the Hudsucker Proxy, it was over. It was, it was, we were off the race. So. Um, and then I met Barrett. Um, Trivia night? Trivia night. And one of my earliest Barrett memories, my, my first impression of Barrett was that he was a button pusher. And I think he still is. He's like a Woody Woodpecker, right? He's like a, <laughs> like that kind of guy. <laughs> And I just remember there was, a, there was a girl sitting on our table who was friends with a guy, we'll call him Steve. And Steve left something along these lines. And Barrett goes, boy, that Steve's a real asshole, isn't he? Just to see what her reaction would be. He didn't even mean it. And he was laughing as he said it. And that was my first impression was like, he, he likes to push like, He's an awful person. He? <laughs> he's an awful person. And, she, and she's like, no, no, I think he's nice. Like, no. And he's like, yeah, he might be nice, but he's awful. He's an awful guy. <laughs> Let's talk about all the time where Barrett was an asshole. <laughs> no, it's... You like to find boundaries, though. I remember the very first podcast we recorded, you would look me directly in the eye and ask sexual questions just to see how <laughs> <laughs> it's like you, that's definitely is, like you're this trying is to being it friends out. with a psychologist that's yeah. Exactly. yeah that's fair I, 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 Barrett and I hit it off immediately so I don't have the bad <laughs> oh, I didn't say it was bad I don't have like I don't have anything like what you guys are going off very well right now <laughs> that's alright no uh, I, I didn't dislike him no, when no, I no, met I him that's I just, not what I meant I'm sorry no, only Chris I hates. I wish I, had, I, I, wish I had a story like and this. And that is continued what I'm to this day. <laughs> <laughs> He's an awful person. Come this guy, on. this guy was really I mean, an I, asshole. I, I do, I do think Barrett. Steve. I was, I was, I was 21, I think, when we met. So Barrett was like 18 or whatever. And, and I he would do, get me beer. Yeah, I do think Barrett used me a little bit to get him beer. I think that's partly why he was nice. But we ended up being friends anyway. So. Mm-hmm. We bonded over <laughs> uh, breakfast at the Omni. Yeah, that's uh, that true. That was really kind of the first time we ever chatted. I yeah, just remember thinking, yeah, what a great you guy you got to meet my whole. Family. Yeah, and your family was awesome. <laughs> and very cool. Uh, who wants to be on deck? Anybody want to be on deck? On deck right here. Okay. I'm uh, Joseph Davis. I uh, just live an hour south here in Nashville, in Tennessee. And my question is kind of a three part question. But what's something that's never gotten the movie treatment, like a book? Don't say the Ables, it's too obvious. <laughs> um, a, a TV show, a game, something that's happened in history that, like I said, hasn't gotten the movie treatment that you think deserves the movie treatment? What's something that has gotten the movie tri- treatment but you don't think got quite a fair shake and needs to be redone? And what's something that's gotten the movie treatment that is just so bad you think it just needs to be killed and just gotten rid of throughout history? Mm. Two that answers all three of your questions. Mm. And they're both Stephen King properties. Mm. The one that hasn't gotten made that should is The Long Walk. Yes. yes. I don't know how this hasn't been Otherwise made. It's up. it's a ter- it's actually a Richard Bachman well, book, it's, right? It's it's option like it's been in the process of being made many times. It's kind oh. of a talisman. Well, exactly. Yeah. So that is one of the most interesting books about walking that you will ever read, and it, it's literally all about this. It's a bunch of kids, and it's like a Hunger Games type, yeah. type of thing where they're selected way, to walk well before Hunger Games. Whoever falls b- below a certain miles per hour uh, average gets shot, that gets killed. Me. Yeah, he would be me. first out. <laughs> <laughs> and and whoever continues the longest is the winner, right? Crazy. And especially in all these adaptations of, like, you know, post-apocalyptic YA type of things, this should be perfect for that. Never gotten, like you said, never yeah. really gotten uh, further. And an interesting thing, because there was just news about this, um, about the Dark Tower. Um, I think that deserves a much better treatment than what it got last year, two years ago. Yeah, I think it was two years ago. Idris Elba and and Matthew McConaughey. It was a terrible movie. Like, not even just being a fan of the the, the series and stuff like that. It was like they chose to to not even adapt a story from it. It It was a different story. Using similar characters, but it was ju- it was just a hot garbage. Took all the mystery out of it. And yeah, there was there yeah. was nothing besides 
Like a shoot 'em up, basically. I heard right? somebody say the other day it was it was seventy five. I wish I could remember who this was. It was another podcast, but it was like it was seventy five percent the first book, and then the rest was the last two pages of the last book. <laughs> like <laughs> that's that was exactly essentially right. what they did. That's yeah, exactly that's right, true. actually. Yeah. And I, I heard that there was going to be yet another TV ap- adaptation of Amazon. it. Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope it is done well. I'm not saying that Idris Elba couldn't have been a great role in. Emmerich, what is his name? Roland DeShane. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's Roland DeShane. Uh, yeah, Roland DeShane. Uh, he could be great, but uh, they they got to have better material. So those that's my answer to both of those. Uh, so I know Artemis is going to be made into a movie. So I can't that, wait. That's for that. that's going to be awesome. Uh, so I, I mean, I, it's kind of cheating to say that, but I'm I'm not familiar with too many of the ones that haven't been made, or I've read the ones that haven't been made. Is that the Andy Weir? Is that his name? Yeah, the yeah, Martian. Yeah, yeah, Andy yeah. Weir. Yeah. I haven't read that book yet. I have it. Uh, Artemis is, is going to be an awesome movie. I that can't sounds up my alley. And then, um, and then, like as far as I wish they'd make a better adaptation is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That's what I yes. was going to say. Yeah. That was my choice. Uh, I, re- I, li- I like. I'm the only one up here who likes it. Yeah. Um, I like it okay. No, it's just those books are so I, good. It could be better. Like could I be feel better. like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy could be a better like maybe Netflix series oh, than, yeah. Uh, yeah. than a whole movie. And you can you know why they they it was so considered unfilmable for so long. There's so many weird things. There's so many. It doesn't fit in two hours of a movie. Mm-hmm. It needs to be expanded as a as a series would be a ten to twelve episode type of thing. And if they wanted to, I mean, I don't know if they would go all the way to mostly harmless on the books or anything, but uh, they could do anything with a TV series that they wanted to. Well, I don't know yeah. who I don't know who's behind it, but on BBC, the BBC did Dirt Gently recently. There was like two or oh, three yeah, seasons. Oh yeah, yeah, I heard about that. And that was really well done. I would love to see those people attempt it Is that because Elijah I think. Wood? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think they would do a really good job. I mean, they clearly got a. They clearly understood what what Douglas Adams was doing with that material. Mm-hmm. So it'd be interesting to maybe see them do the Hitchhikers. How many yeah. books are there? Five. Yeah. Really? Like yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. They, they as they gotten because they kept calling it a trilogy, and then the uh, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish came out, and there's like the. Now the misappropriate, the the, unappro- the inappropriate called trilogy, and then like the increasingly in- more inappropriate <laughs> when they got to the fifth book, you know, increasingly inappropriate nice. trilogy. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think Hitchhiker's Guide would be uh, would be something that if they gave it more time to breathe and everything. I mean, yeah, if you're a bi- if you're a huge fan of Hitchhikers, you've seen the BBC stuff. You've seen, the, you've heard the radio program. Mm-hmm. I think the radio mm-hmm. program came first. Mm-hmm. Uh, then they did the BBC thing that looks like Doctor Who almost. Yeah. And then uh, then they did this movie in 2005, which is, yeah, it's okay. But yeah. it, it deserves a lot better. Uh, my answer uh, for <laughs> the book that I really wish had a movie made about it is Magician's Nephew. Oh, um, yeah. From uh, C.S. Lewis's *Line Witch in the Wardrobe* series, they you know they keep taking shots at getting that whole thing started, but they never get to the like the more interesting books in the series. Uh, *Magician's Nephew* is such a great is book. Is that the next one? Uh, I think they technically did. it's like this, the the penultimate one. It's like the second to the last. Yeah, I, think. I don't think. It's but the it, but it, one. chronologically, it takes place first. It's a prequel to the to the other books. Okay, so um, they did Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Correct. Right? But yeah. nobody watched it. Supposedly, nobody, and they supposedly they're making the next one. Silver Chair? Yeah, some, somebody, some company. I think so. I think yeah, Australian yeah. band. <laughs> I, think, I think I did hear that they are yeah. going to go ahead and make Silver Chair. I just really want to see Magician's Nephew because it's my favorite book in the series. Okay. And they just never get around to making it. So. I'm trying to remember if I've read that one. Uh, which What was that one about? Well, it's it's a prequel that kind of gives all the it's if you love world building, it's the world building of kind of the Narnian idea, and so it kind of gives all the the backstory on how where things came from, where the wardrobe came from, all that kind of stuff is because is there. So. I don't know if this is the same one. I know I read one that I thought would have been an, a, a hard one to make, and it was where the two kids are jumping around in these like uh, pools. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, is that the same one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where yeah, and, and and they see you know how the white witch can come mm-hmm. out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and it was it's it's generally just them observing everything. So I was like, how do you make that into a movie? That yeah. would be interesting. I just know it was the my favorite to read. Like when I was reading those the first time mm-hmm. growing up. So yeah, yeah. So there's probably some nostalgia there too. Yeah, for sure. Um, I read a lot. There's I got I have a lot of books that I would love to see. There's one actually I'm reading right now called Meddling Kids. I haven't finished it, so I don't know if I can use this, but it's really interesting. It's um. It's written by Edgar Cantero. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that name. Cantero, maybe. 
Uh, but it's um, it's essentially like a weird take on the Scooby Doo gang, where it's like a real it's not the Scooby Doo game, but it's like real life four kids and a dog that like solved this these mysteries when they were kids. And the last one they did, um, even though they did catch a man in a mask, um, there's something about it that's like always fucked with them, I guess. For their and they like one of them ended up one of them ended up committing suicide. And there's it's a much it's a much darker version of Scooby Doo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so they they finally realized that there was actually something really going on behind it, other than just a guy in a mask. So they're going back and trying to figure out what really did happen that summer. And it's just a really interesting take on that whole idea it's just like somebody who was like oh this would be kind of fun to do a dark scooby-doo but there's a dean koontz novel that i've always thought would be really cool and it's called strangers and i remember that yeah and it's it's one of those i mean versions of this have been done but it's one of those where like six or seven people wake up and uh they don't know why they're where they are they don't have any memory of what they're Mm -hmm. doing and then Throughout the book, you find out why they're all connected and stuff, and it's it's a it's a much better version of that story than I think we've ever really seen. So that's one I've always thought would make a really really cool movie, and they've done a lot of bad, bad Dean King Phantoms. adaptations. Yeah, Phantoms, <laughs> Hideaway. I Hideaway really, was Jeff Goldblum, right? Yeah, I'm trying to think of some. I can't really think of something I would have liked. I mean, I I I don't really like The Stand. I didn't think that was done very well, the TV movie. Oh, I, but a lot I of people like that, yeah. But it doesn't hold up very but well. But they're, re- they're already doing that again, so maybe we'll get to they're see that. They're doing it again? Yeah, for on sure. CBS All Access or whatever oh, it's called. Oh, I can't wait to get CBS All Access. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to now, man. I can't wait for Twilight Zone. Speaking of uh, Jordan Peele. Yeah, yeah, actually, that may be. How many people are going to get the free month of CBS All Access just to watch all the Twilight yeah, Zone? I actually will do that. Well, yeah. and then I can finally watch Star Trek, too. Binge, Discovery. Binge which it I all seen. in that one yeah, month. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't. Yeah, maybe, maybe the stand. I don't. That's as good as guess. As good. As okay, as here, as here are my, here's my thinking. Um, my favorite book I've ever read is a book from the the early aughts, two thousand aughts, uh, called "Peace Like a River," uh, by an artist uh, author named Leif Anger. Um, he's written three books in total, and this is the only one that made any noise for a while. Billy Bob Thornton was attached. Uh, and you could find it on the IMDb, and it's disappeared. Uh, but it's a great book. It's a period piece set in the 30s or 40s about a son and his father who go on a road trip looking for his brother who's disappeared. Um, and there's a spiritual bent to it, uh, but it's just the prose is so good. I don't think, I mean, if I could write 10% as good as this guy, um, I would never ask the universe for anything ever again. <laughs> um, and so I would love to see that adapted. It's a nice little personal human story. Um, I really want, this is never going to happen, uh, but I really wish when they made Jurassic Park movies, they would have let John Hammond stay evil instead of turning him into this cuddly old grandpa. Yeah. Um, because in the books, he's the best kind of villain. Like, oh, he's he great. is just grinning ear to ear about all the money he's going to make. It, he, capitalism as much as I like Jurassic Park, it messes with the characters from the book. It, not it just really him, does. I reread that before too. the last Jurassic World It does. Movie, both the I first forgot. two movies, they change a ton. Uh, but that, I've that always scary. wished that Hammond could have been allowed to be... Well, you cast Richard Attenborough, you in, can't make him evil. And his death <laughs> is great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, his oh, yeah. death in the book is uh, is crazy. Well, and I forget, who's the who's the hunter guy that goes out right away in the, in the movie? F. Murray Abraham? No. <laughs> Yeah. Muldoon, Muldoon, yeah. Muldoon. Yeah. Muldoon in the book is the best, and then in the movie he's just there for like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Pete Postle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and then okay, this is also never going to happen, but I I wish we could get a Batman movie. Uh, any Batman fans from the comics? Like the Nightfall, Nights and Nights mm-hmm. Quest thing. Like the specific thing I'm after there is that Batman is Bruce Wayne is knocked out of commission. And somebody else he trusts, which is this Jean Paul guy, takes over as Batman. And while Batman is training to get healthier and whatnot, the guy who's play acting as Batman goes way too far over the top, starts killing people, he's vicious, he's kind of insane. And then Batman, ultimately, the end of that story isn't Batman versus Bane, mm-hmm. it's Batman versus Jean Paul. Um, Jean- as- Azrael. That as made, going. Yeah, that would have made Dark Knight Rises better. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, Dark Knight yeah. Rises kind of went there 10 yeah. percent, and then pulled back, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah, they kind of pulled like in like the X Men Three with the Dark Phoenix storyline, yeah. or they just kind of threw it in as a side note. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, who was on deck? 
Um, so I read The Ables, and like if you had to choose between writing sins for the rest of your life or writing novels for the rest of the li- your life, and you could novels. Novels. And what's your for what reason? And then what are some of your literary influences? What kind of uh, drives your pl- prose style? What do you like? If you could take any book and erase the author's name and add yours, what would it be? <laughs> if I could pick any book in one and. And erase the author's name and then be like, no, this is my book now. I am writing like Leaf this. Leaf Anger. Uh, <laughs> what, what you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, well, I read a lot of Clancy um, and a lot of Crichton. That was that was my main bread and butter. And I know a lot of biblical religious authors and fiction and nonfiction. But I, I don't think I'm like a student of literature to where I have like a really – good answer for this question. I think comic books clearly influenced my writing and why I chose to write about superheroes. I was mostly a Batman and Green Lantern reader when I did read comics. Um, But I think ultimately, I've I've always played with words. I've always played around. In college, I wanted to be a screenwriter. We did some poetry. We had a little poetry club for a while. I wrote songs, and I was in a band for several years. Um, and we wrote Sins. Are they playing like a movie next door? It sounds like it. Um, it's like so a wild tra- The latest Transformers film is yeah. playing in the next auditorium over. Um, Either that or a muscle car. This is <laughs> some guy driving back and forth. I just realized at some point it's always been about words. It's always mm-hmm. been about uh, me playing around with words and positioning them in ways that, that make them fun for me. Um, and I, I love... I didn't mean to be dismissive of the sins earlier with your question. Oh, no, no, no. I love what we do. Uh, it's very. I think those of you that have stayed with us for as long as you have can see our personality in that writing and how much fun we're having doing it. But yeah, if I had to choose one thing, I would write books, and it wouldn't. It wouldn't even be the Ables. Like I want to finish the Ables. I've got two of them done. Right. I know where it's going, but I've got a space station story in my head that I'm dying to write. <laughs> but I feel like it's not the right time. Mm-hmm. And part of what's happening now is to set me up to be able to write that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't really answer your question. I just rambled no, for a while. No, you didn't. You, <laughs> yeah, you answered the question. All yeah, right, no, good. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned religious texts. Yes. So if you could take one like one author off and put your name, it would be the Bible? The Bible. It would be, <laughs> it would be Jesus. <laughs> Written by, by Jeremy Scott. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, David. <laughs> All right, right, you were on deck. Uh, Mike, also from Nashville. Awesome. Just, uh, just west to here. Two-part question for all of you. The second one's just a yes or no. Uh, I know you all have movies that some of you like, some of you don't. Some of you see good parts and some of you see bad parts. And you know, some of them hold up, some of them don't. What's one movie that one of you loves that all three of you hate and will keep giving them shit and raking them over the coals worth ref for the rest of their lives and mm. vice versa what's one that you love and everyone else hates or the way I said it before mm. and then the other question I had is have any of you gotten a chance to see the uh, the live riff tracks that they've done in town either at uh, TPAC or up at uh, Did you say riff tracks? Yeah the riff tracks the MST3, MST3K spinoffs um, uh, at, the, at the theater? Yeah, the, the, uh, the Barrett and theater. I went to see Plan 9 from Outer Space awesome. when they did it. And we saw Night of the Living Dead, although and, we weren't live. Yeah, we weren't yeah. at the live one, but they were doing it at Belcourt that night when yeah. we went to the Green Hills one. Yeah. So, yeah, so. And it was fucking hilarious, too. Yeah, My yeah. God, I was rolling. That was so much fun. Oh, that was a great, that was a great night. Yeah. Oh, this one's easy for me. If you've ever listened to the podcast, I love... G.I. Joe, Rise of the Cobra. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Believe that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it's a masterpiece, but listen. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sh- Tatum Channing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Right. Uh, Kim Possible. Uh, Sienna Miller. This is she looks like Kim Possible. This is yet a, this is yet another this is yet another movie where uh, we're Miller making the quality based on the people that are in it. Okay, yeah, I know, but it, but it's fun. It's a fun movie. No. Uh, G.I. Joe Rise of the Cobra. <laughs> it's got the Scottish guy that's not Doug Ray Scott. <laughs> Wait. The, the other Scottish... You know what I'm talking... Jared other, Butler? <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the other, other Scottish It's Christopher... Uh, Christopher <laughs> Eccleston. Sean Connery. Christopher Eccleston. Yeah. yeah. Ecclesiastes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Is he Scottish? Um, uh, okay. No, there's, there's other people. Marlon Wayans? Uh... Uh, uh, 
hold on. There's one other. Can big... we just have a new podcast where you just describe movies? <laughs> just, just go through the cast. <laughs> That's the best. There's another big. I think Bruce, Bruce Greenwood is the president. No, uh, uh, Jonathan Price is the president. Okay. Uh, this is a fun movie. It's full of like fun, uh, Dennis Quaid. Um, oh yeah. It's full of like fun tech-based attacks and stuff like that. It's not. It's not one that'll that'll like bake your noodle or anything like that. It's just it's just stupid mindless fun. Good performances, good cast. And if I could give a thought in my brain and implant it in all of you, it would be to like. Yeah, Joe. <laughs> That's a silly thing to say. Yes, I, thought, I, thought, I thought you were going to say Con Air at first, because no, Jeremy and Chris don't like Con Air, right? Um, yeah, Con Air would be one for me, too. I, oh, but I, I like Con I'm Air. I'm going to give you my Con Air. Whoa. Yeah, Con Air is yes. good. <laughs> I've only seen Con Air one time. Yeah. So. And, and that's one time too many. Yeah, it really is, kind of. It's, it's funny because uh, Aaron was saying the same thing uh, that he, only, he saw it like a long time ago. I figured that movie is so ubiquitous. It's on like TNT, like every day. Yeah, and, and it's and like I, a Christmas story. And, and yeah, it's it's the it's the movie that you pass to go to other. <laughs> yeah. stuff. See, I'm I'm on board. No, I'm on board. I, I will say this: though, the difference, Con Air, though, somehow has become like a like in people's minds, uh, like it's it stood the test of time. Like it is a movie that has held up for a lot of people. Like it's a very popular film still. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you look back at like 19, I mean, I think it's more popular than like Face Off, which came out the same summer, and a lot, and Men in Black, and you know stuff like that. It's crazy to think that Con Air, out of all those movies, yeah. has held up for 22 it's a years. Thing of beauty. Uh, I'm pretty sure we've answered this question in some form, and I've probably said Ocean's Twelve a couple of times. Mm. Uh, I'm gonna also throw in a movie I've probably said before, and 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 I honestly I haven't seen it since. But and I, if I watched it now, I'd probably be in your corner. But Lady in the Water mm-hmm. is another one, and and I really like Lady in the Water. You do? I really do. Okay. I really do like too. Ocean's I, yeah. Uh, wow. It's, yeah, isn't that Jesus Christ? <laughs> um, the, uh, <laughs> I like Lady in the Water more than GI Joe. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I, I, I think if anything, uh, late. Loving something like Lady in the Water a lot of times depends on what your mood is and what where you're at at the time. And I've said this before. I was I was working at a theater, you know, watching this like completely empty theater. I was just calm and serene watching it. It just felt right. It was perfect. It was perfect for my mood mm-hmm. at the time. Now, if I watch Lady in the Water now, there's probably a good chance that I hate it. But I'm probably never going to watch it. Yeah, have you avoided watching it just be, for that reason? Like, like, look, let's just, just keep it as a... Good for you. That man. was his like movie that. after The Village, though, right? Yeah, it was too And, I, and I th- you like The Village a lot, too. Yeah, though. I do. I, I don't dislike The Village, but I do remember thinking with Lady in the Water, I wonder if it was just people that were disappointed in The Village... You you wanted to like Lady in the Water because you wanted him to be back, and then maybe maybe that was where some of it came I from. I watched too. it last year. We, we did this thing where, actually, Josh... And I, Josh, who didn't like it, and I, who liked it, tried to convince somebody who wasn't sure about how they felt about it while watching the movie. So we have a commentary for the movie <laughs> of discussion about why it's good, why it's bad. And I still thought, I think it holds up, metaphorically especially. There's mm-hmm. some really interesting stuff going on there. Um, Shyamalan yeah. is the, oh, God, he, he, him, and, him and Lady in the Water, though, it's, it's so just... Arrogant. Yeah, he, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He, yeah, I mean, no he doubt. shoves a lot I mean, down it's your throat insane. in that movie. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's um, didactic to be sure. Yeah, right? yeah. But yeah. Um I have somewhat of an un- unironic love for Armageddon. Okay. So I know a lot of people hate that movie, oh. so oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the animal cracker scene, how can you not? No, I it was before it was and I and I haven't I haven't watched it in a while, and this is the one where I'm like you, where I'm like, I'm not sure I really want to go back and watch it with my new Michael Bay eyes and you know, understanding more of who he Because when I saw it, I didn't have those associations with Michael Bay. I just thought, this is a cool, frenetic, kinetic thing. Put the team together, go do this thing, you know, just have a good time. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed that when I watched it. But I haven't watched it in a long time, and I probably would pick yeah, up on a lot yeah, of that they, stuff yeah. now. So just It's just keep too, the memory. It's too right. much. I was actually on the nine, the when they were doing the years they were alive. I did the 98 episode with them, and we talked about it. And it's just, it's just, it's so bombastic. Like, it's just too much 
I don't yeah. know. It's like sensory overload to an insane mm-hmm. degree, even more so than I think the Transformer films. It's just everybody's yelling. Yeah, Bane's, <laughs> Bane's is most excessive. Is the I mean, the op- and the I mean, you're introduced to Bruce Willis's character chasing Ben Affleck around that oil rig with a shotgun. Yeah, yeah he's going to kill I mean, that It's just the most he's insane flat out character ever. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like, you, have the, you have this disgust, yeah. and then someone is like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> That's what I liked about it. <laughs> but it has a lot of fans. I mean, it it's, does, it's, yeah. It's, it's got I mean, it. what it's got a criterion release. who's that protective brings his hot daughter out to the oil rig anyway? It was a choice. It was a lack of options. <laughs> <laughs> what? She didn't have a mother. She didn't have a mother? I don't know, college. If she had if about my, ten fathers, if my daughter, is what they said. if my daughter ended up with 1998 Ben Affleck, I'd be like, you, you go for it. I understand. I mean, Affleck's the best guy for her on that ring. Oh, does he? Would he rather her end up with Buscemi? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or uh, no yeah. love for Michael Clark Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with Michael Clark Duncan, Jeremy? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yes. Oh yes, that's right. I, I think I contend to this day, if you could go back in time and unwatch un- horrible bosses, and then watch horrible bosses two, first, it's the better movie. But if you've seen the first one first, because the second one's making all the same jokes, it's not as funny. But it makes those same jokes better than the first movie. I wonder if Deadpool's the same way. I, I wonder, that's a good question. I wonder because I, I had the same feeling about Deadpool too. It's just like I've seen all these jokes before, and yeah, it's funny. I wonder if you saw Deadpool two without seeing Deadpool one, if it'd be the funniest thing it ever. Probably would. That's interesting. Deadpool's fading fast, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it faded pretty fast. For De- me Deadpool too. two. Well, I mean, even yeah. the like the merger a couple days ago, and Ryan Reynolds is out there Deadpool with a Mickey Mouse hat, and I'm just like, God, this is all pretty played at this point, man. Yeah. Like, it's hard to keep that level of meta interesting. Yeah. When you've already broken down, you know the sixteenth wall. Yeah. You know there's there's very few walls to go after. Speaking of which, they're filming sense. Hitman it's Bodyguard like Two. Yeah. They're doing a sequel to Hitman's Bodyguard. Did you guys see that set yeah. photo? Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> I mean, that movie went bad, but I just I didn't know it did that well. Yeah. It must have done well in like Finland or something. No, yeah. it actually did well. I don't know. For me, I guess well. I'd have to. I guess I'd have to pick a horror movie. I know you. I don't know if you've even seen it. I know you guys don't like Nightmare on Elm Street, the original. Not as, um, not as much. And I, I really, I mean, that's a cla- that's a classic for me. I, I think that movie's just. I think Wes Craven is an extremely underappreciated director. Uh, he's made a lot of bad movies. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and defend Vampire in Brooklyn. Music but, of the Heart. Yeah, Music of the Heart. <laughs> but um, Nightmare on Elm Street, just the, I mean, just the low. It's I mean, it's almost just like an independent. I mean, I guess it probably did have a little bit of a budget, but it's basically like an. I mean, it's basically a low budget film. It's not independent. I mean, you line well, maybe it is actually, but uh, I don't know. I just think it's a very well made film. I think it's I think it's still scary. Um, because, uh, you know, um, I think Freddy's still a very scary presence in that movie. Uh, Heather Langenkamp is a problem. Uh, a- Acting-wise is a bit problematic as the main character. But uh, I don't know. That movie still gets me. I also really like the first Child's Play movie. Like, like genuinely like it. Like, I think it's a good movie. <laughs> not, not that I just think it's silly. Mm-hmm. Because they actually, I feel like they really go for it in the first Child's Play movie. Uh, yeah, I don't like Leprechaun. But, but the Child's Play, the, the first Child's Play is not trying to be funny. I mean, they're actually trying to make like a serious thriller with a doll as the threat. And uh, I, I think that's as good as you can do with that kind of premise. Um, I think Tom Holland's a really good director, too. So mm-hmm. but that, that probably, it would probably be something like that, because you guys aren't as big of horror fans as I am. At least non-Chris. <laughs> Everyone that's not Chris up here. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, uh, I'm Dylan from Oklahoma, and uh, I'm going to name three movies and Gun to the Head. You have to remake one of them. Ooh. You have to choose this. You have to pick one of the three. And then I have a second question after that. Okay. Jaws, Back to the Future, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You Ooh. bastard. Ooh. And hold on, hold on. You have to remake them. Like, Somebody whichever one you pick, you have to remake burn. it. You have to you choose a director. Can't be Spielberg again. Not that we want that. Uh, or Zemeckis for Back to the Future. And then my second question is, what is your favorite remake, and why is it The Thing? Uh, okay. Good call. <coughs> Thing is a good. That's a good call. Fuck. Uh, <laughs> well, because you're making us remake one of three of the greatest movies ever, I'm gonna make it shitty on purpose. <laughs> and so I'm gonna make Jaws. I'm gonna remake it, and it's basically gonna be Sharknado Jaws. <laughs> uh, so I'll I'll pick like uh, Dane Cook will play the sheriff. <laughs> 
Did you say Rich, to play the shark? The sheriff. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Kevin Spacey's playing the shark. <laughs> um, uh, Richard Dreyfuss's role will be played by Michael Sarah. Racist <laughs> Michael Sarah. <laughs> And um, the grizzled old man with the speech flying, that'll be... Ro- Robert Sheen. Shaw, by the way. That'll be Charlie Sheen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the director... Oh, I already said the director. We're good. That, that, I want we're going to make uh, all the money. Uh, I want to see Christopher Nolan's Back to the Future. Yeah. So, that's Guess what? Choice. He just stole mine. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my boat. Yep. You can always make a cheap. No, that would be awesome because... Uh, because I think he would do something with time travel that... And he'd take it seriously. Right. Yeah, he, uh, yeah you would have to almost make a, a different tone of Back to the Future. Exactly. If you have yeah. Christopher Who's Nolan. playing Marty? Ooh. Please don't Eric Stoltz. Please Holland. don't say Joseph Gordon. Tom Holland. Oh, yeah, it would have to be somebody younger. Yeah, it would have to be. That's yeah, true. Tom, Tom Holland's good. I think Tom Holland's Who's Zach playing Efron. Doc? What? Ooh, Doc. Tom Hardy? Who <laughs> 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 plays Doc? Ted I mean, Danson. put some gray hair Ted on. Dance. Ted Danson. Ted Danson. Oh, no, I like, <laughs> uh, no, 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 I like that. No, 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 I like that because I actually, uh, that makes, he'd be like the, he'd be like a little crazier version of himself on CSI. So yeah. I know I like that. That's yeah. a good call. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah I'm going to go yeah, with call. Alex Garland's Back to the Future. Ooh, well, that could be interesting, okay. too. Similar in tone. He could take it a little more, more seriously. Although, if he did retain the comedic elements of it, I wonder. I wonder if he could do that, right? He he had some he had some hiccups in dread, right? Where he tried to to get Can't a little. Really cute. Put that one on him though, because he wasn't officially directing that movie. But he wrote it though, right? He wrote it, um, and he directed most of it, but just not officially. So it's, it's it's easy for me to look at that movie's faults and go, I'm not gonna blame Alex Garland for that. Yeah, and it's not like well, Ex Machina had a couple of light notice uh, notes in it. Like when uh, Oscar Isaac is drunk and passing out, he's like, who are you going to call? He's like, Ghostbusters. Remember that movie? Dan Aykroyd got a blowjob from a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who would make Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah, I was going to say, I guess I have to pick Raiders, but I'm trying to... I'm Darren just, Aronofsky. I'm trying, you could bring... Oh, uh, oh God. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> can we bring Mc, can we bring McTiernan out of retirement? Oh, yeah. God, I would love to bring McTiernan out. Uh, uh, McTiernan could direct whatever the fuck. How old is he now, though? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> McTiernan's you know, directed something. I'm there, baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw Basic in the theater. Um, you know who I trust to do it is Chazelle. I bet Chazelle could pull mm. that up. Damien Chazelle. Hmm. You said da- you said you mean Damien Chazelle, but I heard Giselle Bunchton because uh, you said Giselle, and I thought Tom Brady's wife directing Raiders of the Lost. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds rad. Can Tom Brady play Indiana Jones? Oh, dear God. Tom Brady. Because oh, <laughs> Giselle's the director. He's just always Brad. walking around. Yeah, that sounds too obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and like yeah. first star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jackson takes my ball and takes it. <laughs> who would, who would, throw me the football, throw me the idol. Oh, yes. what about who what about play Indy? Um, mm. let's see. That feels like maybe Daniel that, Craig. Craig would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, Tom Hardy would be awesome. Idris Elba. Yeah. Oh yeah. Here's what I want: Ryan Coogler's Indiana Jones with oh no, with great. Donald Glover is uh, as Indy. Okay. I'm not, I, Ooh, I would still okay. go. I would go Elba, but uh, but I like Coogler well, a lot. Especially when Coogler also works with Michael B. Jordan a lot. Michael B. Jordan. Jo- yeah, yeah that, actually, he'd be, he'd be a good Indy too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would take either of those. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that would be the, Michael as Sarah, the creepy. Michael Sarah would join the Nazis. <laughs> And then I mean, and then yeah, let's just re- let's just make Creed Indiana because I think Tessa Thompson could be Karen, yeah, could be Karen Random Allen. And we'll just re- do, reunite Creed. What? There you Random go. person we just decided to put oh, on. Oh, I know. Fuck you, Michael Sarah. Yeah, exactly. You're awesome. Yeah. And just FYI, Creed Two is awesome, and it makes Rocky Four awesome. Just so we're all on the same page. I like Creed Two. Yeah, Creed Two yeah, is great. Like Ma'am, I believe you're. They made there. Rocky Four a better movie. Yeah, yeah. I believe you're already. Like, Okay, uh, hi, I'm Summer. Uh, I live here in Nashville. Um, my question, it's a kind of a two-parter. It's for all of you, and they're actually both kind of piggybacked off stuff that both of you have previously said. Chris, earlier you said, you know, when you're channel surfing and it's the 
movie that you skip over mm. to get to another. Is there a movie that if you're channel surfing, you land on it and you're like, okay, time standing still. I'm going to finish watching this because I love it that much. And you always, you know, maybe find something new from it. And my second part of that question, actually, it's a three parter. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I swear I'll go on. A, I promise not to go on a tangent. Uh, Jeremy, you said, you know, if you could watch Horrible Bosses two first instead of Horrible, is there a movie that all of you like a sequel to better than the original? And you mean aside from Empire, right? I haven't seen any of those, and I probably just Sorry, got hated by everybody thing in this that room. All Star Wars fans <laughs> like Empire more than- Sorry, just making a joke. Go ahead. Don't, don't mind me. And um, my other one is, um, as a child growing up, I was kind of sheltered by what I was allowed to watch by my parents. Um, so is there a movie that maybe you watch now that you saw when you were younger and you take something different away from it? Or there's a joke in it <laughs> that now it clicks and it's like, oh, my God, I had no idea that that's what that meant. But that's what that means. And holy shit, I can't believe I was actually allowed to watch that then. <laughs> I mean, every movie in the 80s, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very much I'll, answer, I'll answer that last one first. Dan Aykroyd getting a blowjob by a ghost <laughs> in Ghostbusters. Yeah. I'm like seven years old. I don't know what yeah. the fuck's going on. Yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. All, all, you, all you see when you're seven years old is like, oh, he's, uh, what is that? Uh, it's a ghost? Okay. Well, yeah, you know, he's, you why is he even, going cross-eyed? Even, yeah, you don't even know about the cross-eyed thing. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. It's like, oh, the ghost, the ghost must be doing ghost stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have fucking gotten that? But yeah, you watch it now and you're like, holy shit. He's getting a blowjob from a ghost. <laughs> hey, hey, honey, tonight can we do some ghost stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some ghost if you stuff. aren't doing ghost stuff in your bedroom these For days. For me, though, it's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory because there's that scene where they're licking the wallpaper and then they have, like, those weird visions oh, and stuff. Yeah. And, like, I remember seeing that in college when they did a, a re-release of it. I was like, oh, hey, they're doing acid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I may or may not have had experience with it at that point. But, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's always been my – and, I mean, my – oh, my God, my mom took me to everything. So there was so much stuff I never should have seen. But that was the one I just remember later on. Mm-hmm. The Ghost Boy job's a good one, though. Yeah. Um, the the uh, the the scene with Marty in the in the uh, in the car with his mom, in Back <laughs> to the Future, yeah. is a little bit racier than I remember it being because he's kind of looking at her like because he doesn't look she doesn't look like his mom, All right? And and he's kind of looking at her kind of like uh, she's kind of kind of give a good look. At her. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's what it feels like anyway. They, that may not be their intent, but like it, 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 that scene has a lot more context to it yeah. now. That I, that There's got to be like a Pornhub parody of that. Oh, there just yeah. has to be. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Let's go, somebody I mean. Google that real quick. Right. Um. <laughs> kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I do. I love both the Raid movies, but I think the Raid 2 is better than the first one uh, because the first one to me is is kinetic fight choreography and performance um, in a confined space. And the second movie is it's almost like him saying, now watch me tell this huge sweeping crime story while still doing that tight you it's know, so kinetic awesome. hand-to-hand fight stuff. So the first one's... A lot of people don't like the second one as much because it because it does expand out to the whole city instead of just like one high rise tower. If you've never seen either raid movie, you probably don't know what the fuck I'm talking about right now. Um, but they're both great. Uh, but if I had to choose, the raid two would always be watched first. And then your first question about the flipping channels, I was just talking to these guys about it recently. Hunt for Red October. Mm-hmm. Actually, any That's of the holy one. late. 80s, early 90s, Jeremy Triumvirate of uh, The Untouchables, Hunt for Red October, and Field of Dreams. Any one of those three movies, and I will stop. The real test is what happens when all three of them are on, and I end up just doing this. Yeah. I've seen a lot of Kevin Costner. I I don't want Barrett to take mine, so I'm going to say A Few Good Men. Uh, Uh, I cannot stop watching that. Yeah, man. If it's on. And this isn't on as much as it used to be, but Clue is another one. Uh, Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That's my all-time favorite comedy. <laughs> I haven't, um, uh, I haven't flipped channels for at least a yeah, somebody decade. Somebody was asking me last night about flipping channels. Look, that was a really interesting conversation. Really well, you know, he goes, that right, yeah. My my version of that is walking through the room while my boys are watching a movie, and I can't like leave the room. And uh, Apollo thirteen is always that way yeah, for me. Yeah, that's a good like one. if they're watching Apollo thirteen, not you know, like I have to sit down on the couch and watch it with them. Like it's just. It's one of those kind of movies for me. Uh, mm-hmm. I will say that I have lost so many hours. <laughs> 
with the prestige being on. Oh Jesus! Yes. It's it's amazing, uh, and it and it really does. I can find. It, it doesn't matter where it is. Whenever. I could be in the middle of the busiest day possible, and the prestige comes on, and uh, I could be anywhere in that movie, and I will I watch it to the very end. Yeah. Because it's a miracle. Yeah, it really is. If you think about. I, I, I do this every time I watch it, try and put myself in the writer's room before they st- started filming and how they had plotted and connected all of those because so much is out of sequence mm-hmm. and the revelations come. It's, it's maybe the smartest movie ever mm-hmm. um, because every time I see it, I'm, I'm more impressed by that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how he does it, but it just seems like every scene is filled with some sort of... I mean. It's it's a very Nolan movie where when they're doing the flashbacks, it's got basically narrative flashbacks and everything, and so you're seeing all these different scenes as someone talks over it and everything, and um, it it just it just draws you in and just constantly is doing. There's never any slowdown in that movie. There's never any like. Uh, let's let's see what uh, Rebecca Hall's doing now, and let's see if she's uh, shopping for dresses or something. You know, they don't do anything <laughs> stupid like that. Yeah. You know, like, like why are they showing this? Uh, you know, it, it, it really just it hits those two magicians and just like it makes them the driving force of that story all the way through. There's no fat. I've got a question for you guys. Do you remember? Maybe I misremember, but didn't you did like a tournament with your best of the years? Mm-hmm. Right? Was the prestige in that tournament? Well, it had to have been because it was the best of the years <clears throat> yes. since we've been alive. Who did it lose to? Who did the prestige? I'm just trying to think which movie would it, it be. It probably ended up going up against something like Children of Men or something. Or Jaws like or something. Like a buzzsaw that was... Yeah. Or, do you have that? I'm just curious. I'm sorry. I don't mean to derail us or anything. It's just, got, damn it, Aaron. No, I've got it right here. He's got it. Okay. What beat the prestige? Let me see where it is. That's a, Bear and I were having a conversation. It was a different movie. It's just so I'll tell you weird. what. Like, the Untouchables beat the Prestige. Oh, oh that's fair. That's another one. In I the can't. first oh. round. That's another one I'll start oh. on. Oh, I don't uh, like that. It's a tough one. It is. My uh, stop the the channel surfing is so uh, it's so lame. It's The Godfather, but it also outpaces everybody else because it's so fucking long and it's always on AMC. And that means there's commercials. You better bet your ass I'm going to sit through those commercials and watch the rest of this movie. The Godfather 2 was on AMC the other day. Yes. It was a five-hour broadcast. I know. With all the commercials. I have issues with The Godfather 2. I don't think it's nearly the perfect movie. You, a lot of people would choose Godfather 2 as the answer to the other question of which sequel is better than the, yeah, I the disagree. initial one. I think there's a lot of holes and there's a lot of problems with Godfather 2. <laughs> I think cinematically, it's gorgeous. And it's, uh, you know, it's... Not at G.I. Joe and Rise of the Cobra levels, but well, um, I do find myself drawn into the story because every time like the, the old Vito or the, the young Vito story comes on, I think I'm going to tune out because I like the current stuff a lot better, but then I get wrapped up in that. So, so I watch it all the time. The Godfather 1, I know it's, it, everybody says it's the greatest movie of all time. I, I say the same thing, but I think it's, it's the perfect movie. It, it has, it's like you were saying, there's no part that you want to just like zone out on mm-hmm. like you know where uh, that where it's unnecessary everything as long as that motherfucker is everything is necessary to tell that story it's shot perfect those performances are iconic for a reason and it's glorious so that's mine and then I think you can make a, a case except for Deathly Hallows part one the Harry Potter movies got exponentially better that's a good call. as they went on um but definitely, but fuck Deathly Hallows Part 1. Well, and Maybe Half-Blood sucks. Prince could kind of slide down a couple rungs. Uh, yeah. Order of the Phoenix is where it's at. Order of the Phoenix. Order of the Phoenix is the best one by uh, far. It Agreed. It's the um, best one, even better than Prisoner of Azkaban? I yes. think so. I mean, I personally no. think so. And, it, yes. and Order of the Phoenix has sexy Helena Bonham Carter, so that takes it a little bit above. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It also has Ray Fiennes doing that ah, yeah. ah, laugh, which is the greatest <laughs> moment ever. I'm going with uh, Kill Bill Volume 2, which when those came out, I wouldn't have said that. But over the years, that is definitely the one I want to watch. I love the first one, too. I think I like Kill Bill more than most people up here. I know Barrett's not a huge fan. But um, I think Kill Bill Volume 2, I just think it's a better movie. It definitely um, is. Yeah, I, and I think it, it does a really good job of just concluding all of that. I, 
So that that would I guess that would be my answer. I, I would rather watch else. Tron Legacy than Tron every day of the week yes. and twice on yes. Sunday. Yes. You're pro- you're probably right, but I don't really like either movie, so that's why I, I like well, that's Tron that, Well, and part of the problem is that yeah. Tron just looks so dated now. Oh yeah. Now if the original yeah. Tron looked like Tron Legacy, yeah. story wise, it may still hold up better for me. Yeah, because when we did when I I don't remember who I wrote that with when we did Tron Legacy last year. Um, I watched the original, oh, and I hadn't seen it in forever, and I was like, oh, my God. Because I wanted to make sure I knew what was going on in Legacy. Now, if Amber Abraham's in that movie. <laughs> right? In so Tron? There. I don't think so. Edmurray <laughs> Abraham is in Surviving the Game, Jeremy. <laughs> he's in, a, he's in Star Trek Insurrection. Yes, he is in Star Trek. He might be the best thing about Star Trek Insurrection. Oh, he was, in, he was in a couple of episodes of Homeland. That's, that's where we all know him from. Um, who's next? Hey, guys. I'm Marvin from Dallas. Um, my question is, and I can't remember if I've asked this before on the podcast or not, but can you think of an actor or actress um, that plays a character, uh, two different movies, in which those movies overlap in the same universe? So, for example, Tom Hanks plays that um, journalist in The Post, but he's also the one who calls in the uh, the Watergate scandal in Forrest Gump. Yeah, that's right. And, oh, interesting. Oh, I see what you're saying. Because I, I was like, uh-huh. immediately I thought, like, I was thinking Michael Keaton and, uh, was it Jackie Brown and uh, Out of Sight? But that's, oh, not, that's yeah, not what he's asking. No, no. It's uh, two completely, supposedly different characters that could overlap. Oh, gotcha. the same I mean, you can, you can make a lot of those connections with the Marvel Universe, probably. I mean, Chris Evans... Is famously both in the Fantastic Four and is Captain America, mm-hmm. but those characters haven't necessarily been referenced in the Marvel movies. So I've always enjoyed thinking about Almost Famous and that thing you do as like pop and rock ends of a similar era of music. Like I don't think they're the exact same era. I think Almost Famous is more in the '70s, and that thing you do is more in the '60s. But I always feel I always want those to be the same universe. And just one is the poppy, happy Tom Hanks fun story. And one is the more angsty rock and roll. Love. I, you know, this is one of those, I love this question, but but I would have to think about it because I know that I have thought this about several different Yeah, this sounds like a Chris question. And, uh, and, and, like, I can't come up with one just right off the bat, unfortunately. And I'm going to have to maybe one day answer this question later in another podcast because I can't think of the one. Because I know I've thought this before. Yeah. And there's been, there's been times where someone has done something in a movie and I'm like, oh, yeah, they're just continuing what they did in that last movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just can't. Right now I'm blanking on it. I'll tell you what my pick is. Yeah. What if Al Pacino from, from Michael Corleone... Mm-hmm. The Godfather. What if he lives his life out, dies at the end of Godfather Three, mm-hmm. comes back as the devil yeah. and the devil's advocate? Yeah. Yeah. That's also another good answer to can't I will stop turning channels when I come on that movie. Uh, the devil's yeah. advocate. Yeah, I've seen that's right, way baby. too many times for one person. That's one that you don't want to see edited, though. No, that's true. Uh, that's a good call, though. Uh, I, I really, I'm kind of like you, Chris. I don't no, know. I can't think of what it's like. It's a research question. It's like one of yeah. those you kind of have to get, dig in and <laughs> like give it us homework. I, I know, especially through sinning uh, movies, we have made sins about them being in a different movie a lot of times, and I can't, I can't think of, I can't think. Now, of them right one now. that is kind of interesting though that I just thought of uh, Gene Hackman, um, his character in uh, Tony Scott's Enemy of the. Is it enemy of the state? state, I mean, he's clearly paying homage to the conversation. I don't know if that's really a good answer here, but that I mean, I I mean, I think you're supposed to think that's the same character, grown up and older, and now he's even more uh, paranoid. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I don't, and I and I love and I love that. Like, I think that was a really cool callback in a movie. I'm going to pick it on deck because I'm I'm lazy. So I'll do one from from online here real quick, and then we can get back to these. And then you, and then you, and then you. Um, but you know what show is like that is Doctor Who. There, there are so many <laughs> characters that pop up in the background of Do- you know British actors and actresses that pop up in the background of Doctor Who that later become main characters. It's kind of interesting that way. Uh, online, this is from the YouTube chat, um, and I don't know that I've ever heard the answer to the question, but it seems like one you guys might get quite a bit. Would you ever consider redoing some of your earliest videos? Uh, we'd love to see what you do with Jurassic Park or Avengers with more than three minutes. Uh, Our standard answer has been no, that those shorter, lower sin count videos represent our evolution 
as a channel and as comedians, and I wouldn't want to. I, I, yeah, it's just part of who we are. It's uh, I wouldn't want to change that just to sure. try and improve. I'm and, not George Lucas here. Yeah, that's the, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> Avengers special that's edition. Who were, I mean, that's who we'd be sort of compare comparable, right? That the, oh, I didn't like how it came out the first time. I want to add all this stuff to yeah. it this time. And uh, yeah, I, I we could clearly do it, and it, like it would it would benefit us greatly to do it. But I I just I don't think that we're ever going to. I mean, unless it's it might have to be a special thing. It's I think as maybe as a one off or a future sin week bonus or something, we might do something along those lines. But I think the standard answer has to be a flat hard no, just so we don't leave the door open to get asked every time. Yeah. Because yeah. I know if we said, okay, we're going to redo one old Shorter Sins video, every single one of you would say a different <laughs> answer. And we're not going to be able to do all of them. No. Um, so what, I think the question really comes from people who want to see us go harder at a certain movie. Right, yeah, sure. Um, which I get, but we're, we've got plenty yeah. of movies yet to come. We're gonna yeah, because my thing is occasionally, like, when, I'll, when I'm – when I'm watching one that we're reviewing or whatever, I'll be like, oh, crap, why did I, how did I, well, like, I'm, I can't tell you what the movie was, but there was one where this guy looked straight up like Jeremy Semster, and I'm like, God, I should have done discount Jeremy Semster right there. I think I even commented about that. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, at that point, it's done, and, I mean, there's plenty of good stuff in there, so it would just be going in and adding more, and I don't know. I like them how they are. I mean, I think, I think they're a work of what we were, you know, working at thinking of at that time, and I think that's how they should be, and. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, very good. All right, who is up next? Hey there. I just got it written down so I don't mess it up. Uh, my name's Evan from uh, Michigan, north of Detroit. And uh, what movie would you want to see remade purely because you don't think it lived up to the score? Ooh. I, I mean, I have my answer for this. Let's have it. Uh, Last Airbender. Uh, I mean, first of all, that piece of trash needs to be put off the existence of the universe. Like, that is the worst... For somebody who loved that animated series and somebody who loved M. Night Shyamalan, for him to do that to that world was just, it was brutal. Um, secondly, that score is actually really good. It is a really good score. And so that's, that's James, my... Was it James Newton Howard? I believe it was. Yeah. Um, and so I, that, is, that is absolutely my... It, was, it is the only thing in that movie that I like. So, yeah. Hmm. I got one that actually is being remade and I believe... Is coming out this weekend. Pet Cemetery. <laughs> uh, Pet weeks. Cemetery is a shitty, shitty movie. The 1989 version. It has a score by I think Elliot Goldenthal. That's right. And I that score is fantastic. As is, is the Ramon song. Yeah, the Ramon song. Oh my god. <laughs> Actually, they play two Ramon songs in that that movie, and one of them is really, really good, and then one of them is Pet Cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I love that. I love that song. But I'm that sorry. score, man, is sweeping, spooky, like everything that you want, particularly in a horror score. And I love Elliot Goldenthal. By the way, oh, you could actually apply this to Interview with the Vampire, which he also did. That's an awesome score, but that movie can kiss my ass. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I, would, I would say both of those. I am kind of excited for the Pet Cemetery remake. Though. It comes out April 5th, I think. So I think it's two weeks. It's two weeks, yeah. okay. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that's all right. And um, that's another. That's a great, scary as hell book. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really hoping that they nail it with this one because, man, that book. That I don't know if there's a scarier book I've read. And um, I don't usually get scared by books. I'm going to go with Star Trek: The Next Generation's first movie, Star Trek Generations. <laughs> oh, that's a great call. <laughs> oh, I'm a huge Next Generation fan. I've seen every episode of that show. A dozen times. Uh, I have that nitpicker's guide to the Star Trek Next Generation. I do too. That is I've got Deep Space Nine as well. Sins. <laughs> but that movie, Generations, is a wet, hairy ball sack of a movie. <laughs> and it is William Shatner's fault. Because William Shatner insisted... I don't. To this day, he's kind of like this, but back then he was like it was everything comparing with Nemo, Nemo, Nemoy, Nemoy. <laughs> yeah. um, and he had to be like the big shot Trek guy. He couldn't bear passing the torch to a new cast without infecting that movie with this living in a cabin, even though I'm dead. Bullshit. <laughs> that fucking movie sucks. Did you Phantom Menace that when you first saw it, though? See, I, I thought I liked it when I first saw it because I just refused to believe that an next generation movie couldn't be good. Well, it's, don't know? they don't they start the movie with that like 
they're on an actual ship for like is it Troy and Wolf's yeah, well, wedding no, no, or some it's, shit? Uh, no, they start it with uh, it's Shatner and uh, it's oh, Chekhov you're right, and Scotty, he goes right? Off he gets zapped Because Nimoy, yeah. uh, Nimoy wouldn't do it. That fucking movie. <laughs> oh, no, it's terrible. I mean, I, but I did. They finally I got it right with it. First Contact. They finally got there. But that first Next Generation yeah, movie was hamstrung. It, no, that was bad. That's, and that might even be the worst one. Because Insurrection's main thing is it's just boring. It, it's not a bad story, but it's just boring. And Nemesis is not good, but it is watchable. It is watchable. It is Even boring. fucking Insurrection is watchable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I don't think Generations is. No. So who did, so. was it Jerry Goldsmith that did the music? Uh, I think so. Probably. Probably. He did all, most of them. Uh, but it's a good score? It's the Next Generation music. This yeah. comes from the original, like, the motion picture. What's that score? Uh, Dennis McCarthy. All right, so he probably adapted the theme. Mm-hmm. Dennis McCarthy. Speaking of Phantom Menace, couldn't you answer Phantom Menace to this question? Yeah, yeah, you could. You could. I would that is well, that is an excellent answer. With dual maybe the, the fates highest, and everything, maybe the highest disparity of score to movie that you'll get here. I don't know and, if there's any Phantom Menace. And I don't know if you could make the movie any better, but Carpenter's score on the new Halloween movie was excellent. I have to apologize. And I did not like that movie. I didn't hear you right. I thought you said you wanted to know what we would remake. Due, due to the source. No, no, no. Why, oh. <laughs> what film would you want to see remade because it didn't live up to the scores? So the music was great. I totally yeah. fucked that question up. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought you really liked the Star Trek yeah, I, I like music. Yeah, I thought you did too. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I was talking about the source material of Next Generation. <laughs> I screwed it up. And it's on permanent record. <laughs> 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 That's, yeah, I, would, I would go with Jeremy. the new Halloween movie, probably, because I really like Carpenter coming back. I just like Carpenter coming back and doing a score. Yeah. And I think he did a really good job. He updated it well. I just I just could give two shits about that movie. Yeah. It, it felt like a relic from, like, 1970, even before the original came out. Yeah. Um, the I don't it, most of the time when a movie is t- terrible, I don't notice stuff that's good that about it. And, you know, so if there was a great score and something like The Last Airbender, yeah. I probably wouldn't have even noticed that. I didn't notice till after the fact. Yeah. Uh, somebody posted about it, and I was like, oh, check that out. A couple of movies came to mind though that sort of fit this. I, I I think Jackie is a perfectly okay movie, but the score is like something like otherworldly, and I, I don't know oh. if it, it deser- that movie deserves that score, really. The score seems to be a, a different movie, almost. <laughs> You're uh, like, sir, you have not earned this music. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, I, think, I think Jackie's melodrama is elevated to a level that it just doesn't, it doesn't deserve, really, because it's really just, you know, Jackie Kennedy, what is she going to do with, the, with the John F. Kennedy's funeral and stuff like that? And that's mm. really, it doesn't have much... So the music is like just super intense and awesome, and I'm like, this this doesn't fit for me. But you know, whatever. Um, uh, Interview with a vampire popped in my head. Yeah, I, I mentioned that one. Did you? Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Elliot oh, Goldenthal. Yeah, thing. I didn't even I didn't hear you say that, but you know what's crazy? Not to interrupt, but Elliot Goldenthal, I think, also did Alien. Aliens 3, mm-hmm. and I think did Batman Forever. Yeah, I think that's right. Wow. Both of which are shitty movies oh, yeah. with awesome scores. They do, yeah. So this dude is, is in the cottage industry. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, Elliot Goldenthal also did Heat, didn't he? I believe so, yeah. And and that would be one where it matches a good movie. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, those were the couple that, that popped into my head there. And there's another movie, I don't know if anybody's seen it, called I Am Love that has Tilda Swinton in it. It oh, has a yeah. great score, and the movie is oh, it movie's okay, yeah. but the the score is way above and beyond that movie. So, uh, so what about funny. the score? Was the score How's for the, the score, score for the good? score? Mm-hmm. I like that movie. That's a great movie. Frank Oz. Uh, yeah. Oh, you know what else? Uh, Elliot Goldenthal did Sphere. Nice. <laughs> we were we were discussing we were Sphere discussing at Fear lunch. <laughs> Well, Am I the only one that kind of likes Man of Steel? Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. Okay. But, <laughs> that should have been my answer for something earlier then. But Superman's theme, which is carried on into <clears throat> Batman v Superman even a little bit, that simple, it's like beautiful, and it's the most simplistic superhero theme I've ever heard. Is, is it the John Williams? Yeah. Okay. Um, Watchmen has a pretty good score too, I think, if, I remember, if I'm remembering it correctly. Yeah. But I kind of like that movie, so. Yeah. Very nice. I like it when the guy has a giant blue dong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what movie has a sequel that shouldn't have? 
and then what didn't have a sequel that should have because mm. this is a topic that me and my friends have hit a lot of times because there's mm. a lot of movies that they're like we're gonna get a sequel and then they cut it off mm-hmm. mm. so yeah. had I mean, one and shouldn't have Chris and I might have the same didn't. answer on the didn't I'm, have I'm gonna one. surprise I'm gonna surprise a lot of people with this but I don't think Finding Nemo should have ever had a sequel god uh, damn right that's a bad answer <laughs> no, I, like, it's a, it's I like Finding Dory but I agree with you I, I, I do I enjoy Finding yeah. Dory and I'm a huge Pixar apologist but um, that is just that is a forced sequel if I've ever seen one. So yeah. that that would be my answer. Mm. But it worked for them. Yeah. Uh, Toy money. Story Four. <laughs> <laughs> what? But couldn't you? But couldn't you have said the same about Toy Story Two and Three? You don't what? think? Couldn't you have said the same thing about Two and Three? Yes. What I have always said uh, was that Three is better than Two. Two is better than One. Both the sequels are unnecessary. Yeah. But and this but, one may be better than three. But three but has it, such a perfect ending, like you but said. But the three was as good an ending as you're gonna have. Right. Yeah. 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 And you can't convince me that everyone's back for money. Anything other than money. It's money. Yeah. It's money, yeah. money, money. Yeah. I've already got a government doing I'm that. Feel I don't need same. Hollywood doing it too. <laughs> I'm gonna feel the same if they make a How to Train Your Dragon four because I think like Toy Story three. I don't think How to Train Your Dragon three needs to exist, but it, it's a great ending to that series. Yeah, it does it, feel like yeah. an ending for sure. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the most unnecessary sequels I ever ran across, and I can't tell you what happens in it, is Miss Congeniality 2. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, first, the first movie did decently well, but I, I never thought it was like, oh, yeah, we got to make a sequel to that. And then, yeah, they made Armed and Fabulous or whatever it was called. <laughs> <laughs> um, that didn't that didn't seem uh, like I think in 2005 there were a few of these actually there were a lot of these that just like part two that came out and you're like it was the first one uh, uh, someone something that mm-hmm. everybody wanted horrible and, bosses yeah. yeah horrible bosses <laughs> unnecessary <laughs> yeah. uh, this is kind of probably controversial but the Hunger Games I think the Hunger Games could have ended at the first one told a good story wrapped it up neatly. <laughs> I'm getting death stares. <laughs> <laughs> She's and, uh, shoulder rub. That's how. And, well, I'll tell you this: I actually liked Catching Fire quite a bit. Um, not a huge fan of the the last two, but I think if you ended the Hunger Games, wow. obviously she had a story to tell and she wanted to uh, to keep going and making money. But like, I think I think you've got a good wrapped up storyline right there. This, this is my only legit argument to that. If you're going to latch onto an author's trilogy. Divergent. (laughs) (laughs) And I think, and I think, if they had made Mockingjay one movie, I think they would have done that. Mockingjay Part One actually is not bad, but the no, none of Part Two is. I don't think. I don't think any of those movies are bad necessarily. I know Chris doesn't like. Kind of where they go, the you know yeah, ending the big I'd, government. I'd rather there stuff. not be a revolution at all. I just you, you stay in Hunger Games forever. It's fine. Or you just keep it. showing yeah. different Life Hunger sucks. Games. And Life I sucks. think <laughs> yeah, and I think if it, what you're right, if if you commit if you commit to Catching Fire, then you have to commit to Mockingjay and all that stuff. But had you stopped at Hunger Games, you'd still be in this dystopia. You'll still have somebody who beat the odds and stuff like that. Uh, you'll still have an indelible character. But you don't have all that baggage. You can say this. We had this discussion last week on the podcast about the Bourne movies in that Supremacy and Ultimatum are excellent movies, right? In fact, you know, Jeremy heretofore liked them even better than the first one. But I think the first one is the only one that's, that's free of baggage. Like, it just tells the Treadstone story. It tells the Jason Bourne <laughs> story. It shows clearly how much of a badass he is and what he can do. It shows the nefariousness of the CIA. But, like, by the time you get to Ultimatum, you've got to figure out all the old white guys that are evil and all the Treadstones and the Blackstones and the Joan Allens and all the shit. And one is, is inclusive of all that stuff without being repetitive. So. Well, and, I, and I don't like stuff either with, with stuff like that where you're watching the first Born, uh, the, 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 what's the first one called? Born Identity. Identity. Thank you. And you're watching that, and you're this great relationship develops between Helm and uh, Frank Bam- Polente. Uh, yeah, Patente. <laughs> Patente. But, but then you're <laughs> but, what, what is it? Delicious. Is it Patente? I, I said Polente. Oh, but um, but anyways, and then but then but then after you see the sequel, you you know she dies. So it's like you're watching the first one, and you're like, oh, but I know what's gonna. Even though they're happy, 
I know this person's gonna die, and that yeah. that kind of that kind of sucks. Yeah. Like, but uh, my answer, and please don't throw anything at me, but um, and let me explain this. But my answer is Blade Runner twenty forty nine, and I like this movie fine, but. I think this is still a situation where we're having a lot recently where people are trying to create a universe where there really isn't one. I just don't think Blade Runner needed a sequel. I'm not even a huge Blade Runner fan, but I just, I don't know. I, it just felt like they were trying to create this world that just wasn't there. Is it a sequel? I don't know. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, because I mean, Harrison yeah, I think Ford's you could over, there, Decker's there. Yeah, I it's think you the could remove Decker from... That story and still made like you would just have awesome. another Blade Runner story in the same universe. But yeah. I, just, I just don't think there's a I just don't think there's enough there, which they're not probably not going to make another one because that one didn't do well. But I don't think there's enough there to create a series of movies. No, I don't think a series. I yeah. I tell you what, I'm, I'm loving That's, Blade Runner 2049. It's so good, much more every time I watch. No, I, it, it, I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It would be my answer for I'm the probably question like earlier. Jeremy, the Toy Story. About a sequel that's better than the original. I think Blade Runner 2049 and you might is be much right. better. Oh, than Blade it definitely. Is. And you might be right, yeah. but the one problem I have with it is I just I feel like they're trying to force something that's not there and I can I still can't believe how much money they spent on it. I can't yeah. believe how they ever thought they were going to Well, if they were going to make that movie, they were going to have to back up the Brinks truck. Yeah, I guess. And clearly they did. They got Deacons, they got Villeneuve, they got Gosling. Yeah, but my question is, did it did it pay off? It didn't walk away with any major awards. Mm-mm. It didn't make a ton mm. of money at the box office. No. And Villeneuve's moved on to Dune with a cast that got 30 amazing actors in it. it is Dune going to make any money? I don't no. know. I don't think it is. I think it's going to look amazing, but I don't think people give a shit like, like they yeah. think they do. Yeah, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be in the same. I mean, the only thing with Dune is I don't think the original has the fan base that Blade Runner did. No. So he could. The I books mean, might. And I don't know that. Yeah, the books probably do. And I don't know that enough people. Uh, there's probably a lot of people that haven't seen the original. So this this could be. I don't know. I think this will do better. And I don't think they're spending as much money on it. They could be. I don't know. I just don't this, think you can make it without spending that much money on it. This, yeah, you might uh, not be did, able to. It did win. Best cinematography and best visual effects. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did win a couple of awards. That was the first Deacon's win, wasn't okay. it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah. I stand corrected. This this question for me comes down to world building. Like, if it's a world I want to go back to, I feel like sequels are a little more necessary. Um, this is one of the reasons I keep defending against uh, a lot of people the Avatar sequels. Mm. It's a world I want to revisit. You know, James Cameron may not be the most original storyteller, but he's a great world builder, and I want to go back and see kind of the other aspects well, we of had Pandora. We have conversation about Alita, too, on your Exactly. Podcast. I think that's another good example of where I would, I would yeah. love to see a sequel to Battle Angel. I think that would be interesting because I love the world building. I actually think Ender's Game would be a cool world to go yeah. back well and there's and already see. books yeah and you've already got the the source material so that's for me when i see something like a sequel that i wish they would make it usually comes down to worlds i want to go revisit again so i'd just like to point out before we move on steve martin got to make two pink panther movies <laughs> and two cheaper by the dozen oh my movies God, yeah. just for the record <laughs> so what what's the what's the sequel you wish happened that was the other uh, part of the question Does yeah that's what i was just talking oh, about I'm with sorry, the, I'm sorry, world, with the world building i would yeah. say the raid three <laughs> yeah, I, w- I would say I was going to say zero effect. I didn't know if yeah, you would have that. I mean, answer. That would probably be my answer. Yeah, I, zero effect is, and I know Chris has talked about it a lot on the podcast. So a lot of you, if you haven't seen it, you probably heard him talk about it. But I, I don't know. That's just that. That could have been a great, like, fun series of movies. And they were with they, Bill Pullman. They were making a series with Alan Cumming. Oh yeah, that's one. right. And uh, I would have watched and, that yeah, too. I would have watched it as well. I, I, I you know, uh, he's. He's Sherlock Holmesian, but there was something about him that was a, a little bit more interesting. It, it it did a very good job of it did a very good job of modernizing uh, Sherlock Holmes, mm-hmm. which I mean I think the BBC Sherlock series did maybe did it a little better, but it but it was different. He was he was like a it, well he was kind of like um he was kind of almost more like a like a hippie like a slot I don't know I, I, he kind of I don't know if it'd be inherent vice would be a good example but mm. he was almost kind of like of that breed of detective yeah he was when, he, what I like about it that he's he was doing real police work and yeah it yeah like, there's it actual like, detecting like, in it. oh I see a drop of wine next to a mantle and then yeah. oh, there's a secret room there and then, you know all that I, I, I 
the, the Sherlock Holmes stuff starts getting ridiculous. Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. Yeah, he was I'm actually not saying like, that the the downy, know you know, the downy ones are yeah. like so adhere to the Arthur Conan Doyle stuff, <laughs> but you know. But no, he's actually like writing stuff down and finding patterns and figuring yeah. things out while playing his guitar. And I, I don't know, it's just a really fun movie, and I would have loved to have seen more in that world. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think it made like two million dollars. Yeah, like I, and <laughs> and, they, like, and according to Jason Blum, they're not making Happy Death Day three, but I would love to see that. No, oh, really, and they and they said, I, but who knows if they? I mean, well, who knows they said if that they would had stick. a story ready yeah. for it too? You're up, Isaac from Maryland. Hey there, um, welcome. Question for all of you. Uh, is there a movie that you know intellectually is good, but for something that happens in the movie or a logic fallacy or something, you can't personally enjoy it? Mm. The English Patient. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be my answer. I'm sure you guys have your own answer. But I, I, I've never been able to knock The English pa- Patient for its filmmaking. Um, it looks gorgeous. Great sets and cinematography. The acting's okay. The movie just bored me to tears. I, I have the same reaction to Lawrence of Arabia. Oh God, me too. Whoa. Yeah. Oh no. I know it's great. Yeah. I know. I know in, intellectually it's great. It bores me to tears. Yeah. Same. So that's that's my answer. Well, based on his question, I know you have a you have a uh, you're not a big fan of gangster movies, right? Because that's you true. Have yeah. A hard I, have, time. I have. So the antihero is an interesting thing for me um, because I don't mind a good antihero like mm-hmm. Walter White. Yeah. If if this if the material is presenting the antihero with the consequences. Mm-hmm. And the um, the the depth of what their actions may cause them. I feel like, especially Cors- Scorsese has a, a glorification thing he does with the antihero that feels exuberant and exciting and fun, and that's that's hard for me to get through sometimes. Yeah, and I, I mean, and when you said that, I, I, that's actually made me kind of reflect and look at it a little. I'm not saying I dislike the movies, but no, no, no. it's made me look at it a little differently. That is very interesting, and I, and I can see the expert movie making yeah, there yeah, as well. But yeah, that's another good example of some of the movies for me. Uh, even though I like it better than I uh, did when I first watched it, Pan's Labyrinth always went under this for me. Um, I I think it's beautiful. I think everything you know you uh, I like I like the the fairy tale aspect of it. I just didn't I don't know I don't think I liked the um, the little girls uh, just sort of like making up rules as they goes along type mm-hmm. of thing. Uh, to to somehow end up winning in the end. I mean, I it's I, I like the movie a lot better than I did when I first watched it, but it, it feels like that's the one that comes up. That, that's that, another one I still haven't seen. That's on my uh, it, list of shame. It's, I guess. It's, it's gorgeous. It's, yeah. uh, I mean, and, and I, like I said, the second time through, I liked it way more. But but um, I think we're both on the same page with Del Toro too. Like I have that issue with a lot of his stuff, oh, yeah. where I get why people like it. I'm just not connecting to it the way mm-hmm. most people are. Yeah. Um, you got one, Barrett? I've got two. So speaking mm. of uh, Del Toro, the fish sex movie never really <laughs> got me. Yeah. I've seen that movie. You're talking about the fish sex chronicles, right? Yes. <laughs> are you talking, talking about uh, little fish good at sex? Yes. <laughs> little fish good at sex. You talking about Finding Dory? Yeah. Uh, that movie, there's, there's a lot to like in that movie, and I do like some things in there. Um, I love Michael Shannon's performance. He's bonkers. Um, and actually, um, Lily, uh, woman. <laughs> May, yes. Paddington. Sally Hopkins, yes. Uh, Hawkins. Let me try that one more time. Sally Hawkins is fantastic. But Tune in like, next week to very explaining can't, movies. I just can't yes. get around to it uh, to really love it. Another movie, I believe from the same year, is Call Me By Your Name. And beautiful movie, objectively fantastic. I didn't even think it was boring. I could not get on board with this grown-ass man seducing a 17-year-old boy. I understand it's different in Europe, okay? But for whatever reason, like, I just cannot get on board with somebody who's that much older and a kid who's very confused at the time. Admittedly so. You know, kind of... Perpetuating this relationship, so that was one thing that just I, I just couldn't sign up for. I have a bonus one, D- very unrelated to "Call Me by Your Name," <laughs> Infinity War. All right, <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of problems with Infinity War. All right, it's it's too much. It's too much of a movie. They're crammed in too much. I like a lot of it, but there's too much. That's it. <laughs> 
All right, so fish sex, yeah. actual sex, mm-hmm. infinity. Right. right. <laughs> I just have to. I do have to shout out Richard Jenkins in Shape of Water, though. He's performer. Oh, I, he I, is really good. Richard too. Jenkins really good in that movie. It's Anyways. it's made up of a bunch of disparate <laughs> parts that I like. Yeah. But I. I even like the fish sex. That's fine. <laughs> Do your thing. Can we can we get that as a poll? A can we pull that audio out? And use that <laughs> I'm having a hard time thinking of one. Um, I mean, there are some classic movies I don't really like. The African Queen is one I I just really don't like. Catherine Hepburn I think is terrible in that movie, even though she's a great actress. But for some reason, her voice and her 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 choice of the way she vocalizes in that movie is insane. And it just drives me crazy every time I try to watch it. A more recent movie, though, um, Thor Ragnarok. Really? Um, I know. I'm terrible. I'm a horrible human being that should go shit myself. But um, <laughs> you don't uh, have to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that right here. I'm gonna do it right here. Um, no, I just, I just, I like. Uh, oh, I cannot. I'm not. I'm gonna butcher the director's name. Taika Waititi. Thank you. Um, I love what we do in the shadows so much. Um, I think he's a very funny dude, but I just did not find that movie very funny. I think a lot of it has to do with Hemsworth. Um, I just because I love Tessa Thompson. I what's, like, what's your problem with him? I don't know. I just don't. I just I don't know. Maybe it's not him, but I just don't find that movie as fun and funny as most people do. I don't like most of the Hulk stuff either, other than the the gag. I love the sight gag at the end. Do you like him as Thor in the other movies and just not – because no, no, this I is do, a very you know different what, that, Thor in that's this a, movie. Yeah, and that's, a, that's, a, that's probably a bad example. He's fine in it. I, I, just, I just don't think the movie works for me like it did a lot of people. And I, like in Kate Blanchett, I mean she's beautiful and she's great. And, but like she – I had a lot of problems with her like I do a lot of the MCU villains. I just didn't think there was enough there. No, that was I a also, bad character. I also – all the – just all the bull- – I don't understand – Who's more powerful? Like I thought that movie was really guilty mm-hmm. of that. You know, she could break his hammer, but then somehow he still defeats her. I, I don't know. There was just a lot of stuff going on there that because he got his lightning powers. There man. you go. He got his lightning powers. Um, it was fine. Well, I mean, he always had them. I, I'm like I'm like Jeremy. <laughs> I liked it fine. I didn't want to have sex with it. I feel like mm. I'm like well, Jeremy with that. Well, one. And, I, and I want <laughs> to have sex with most movies. That I've seen, <laughs> yeah. So. But that, that's the only recent one I can think of where I just wasn't on the same page as everybody else. For those who aren't sitting directly next to Chris, when we mention these classic movies that we don't get, he has audible reactions. Like, uh, do you want to talk about Lawrence of Arabia and just give it some love? Because that one really hurt you. Um, yeah, that movie is great. It is. It I is agree. I'm with Chris fantastic. on this one. And uh, the boredom that you're feeling is really your fault. <laughs> I will say, though, I will say if you ever have a chance to watch it on the big screen, if you have not done that, that is a much better... That's, I did that's watch the it way on the television be, screen. So, yeah, yeah. That is, I mean, I'm just saying that does enhance some of it. But, I mean, it's not like you're not saying it's not a good-looking movie. Though. However, no, it's, it's, it's such gorgeous. a big movie, though. It, uh, you, people in here might want to pile on to me for this one. I don't like Dr. Zhivago. And that's for the same reasons that you're stating for Lawrence of yeah, Arabia. Yeah, it just happens. And Dr. Zhivago is one of those movies that's always like in the top ten mm-hmm. IMDb and all this other stuff. And I watched it. I just, I, it I, sucks. Yeah, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> it's, uh, it straight up sucks. Who's got questions? we got a little more time. All right, you here, then you, then you. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm from uh, Dallas, Texas. And I want to talk about nudity. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. This is not. This is not the podcast. That. We never talked about. Nudity. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm so this, tell you about love, so, death, and robots. So this question is for Chris. <laughs> no. Uh, so modern cinematic classic MacGruber. Um, so that has one of the like the funniest uh, uh, nude scenes. Bart, like him having sex with his the ghost of his wife, is yeah. freaking hilarious. Mm-hmm. So, what is like your favorite comedic nude scene? Comedic nudity. Mm. Oh, oh man. Roma. <laughs> Roma. All right, Mr. Roma expert, explain to me why it is vital for homeboy to do his karate with with little little man hanging out. Uh, it's character development, right? Like huh? it's like his whole character is is self centered and about himself and. He wants to show off, and you know she finds it charming, and that kind of stuff in the but moment. But why's he got to be nude? It well, takes time to put on underwear. <laughs> <laughs> you get done doing it, you want to impress the lady, you do that. You don't there waste is, time putting on no, the no, underwear. No, no, no. There is a there is a cultural aspect too, to especially outside of the United States of America. You know, the human body and athletic 
competition has been a long time thing, you know, as far as, you know, I mean, the Olympics originally were all nude. So, you know, it's kind of one Alfonso of those Alfonso Cuaron was not alive during the fucking Olympics. Like, <laughs> back when they were naked, all right? I'm I just, just don't get saying. it. I don't it's, get it. And it, it took me out of the movie. And I figured they would come back and figure, you know, contextualize this at all. But no, it's just homeboy apparently in a room by himself doing dick calisthenics. <laughs> yep, yep. There's, I think there is a... I think there is a feral, wild nature to what he's trying to do that he thinks the nudity complements. All right. All right. Well, and especially in, in, in stuff like that with the martial arts, so much of it is about form, you know, body and form, and, you know, so, yeah. I think there's a lot to it. So, Walk Hard has, oh, uh, yeah. has probably one of the best. That's uh, a great... It's, really, it's just the way they present it. Like, it, it's not like... It's just he's on the phone with his wife, and it's just people. It's, they're filmed with the waist down, and then and, <laughs> and it's just like they come into the they come into the screen just to like handing him stuff, and there's dudes just dicks hanging. The dick out. is right here, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's it, so it funny. It is interesting, by the way, that female nudity rarely is funny, but there is one in Knocked Up. I believe no, Forty Year Old Virgin. Where the, they're on that speed dating thing, and that girl's boob pops oh, out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's but, like in uh, uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Oh, yeah, yeah, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang <laughs> has one. That spider goes under her shirt. And <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's, the, there's also when... Uh, when she's telling him the story and everything, and he's like, he's like, uh, don't don't focus on the don't focus on it, don't focus on it, and, he, and he's and he, and he says, and there's a nipple, and, he, and, and you know, it just pops out there or whatever. But um, but yeah, uh, that yeah, that walk hard one, man. Walk hard is the guy's like, he comes up, he's like, do you want you want some coffee? And the dick is right here, and the phone is right here. <laughs> yeah, and he's yeah. like, hang on, honey. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah. I'm going to go with uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Oh, oh that's yeah. a good one. Oh, with good the, one. the shocking dong shot in the first scene of the movie. And, um, and then the awkward length of time he remains naked. Yeah. And she repeatedly asks him to go put clothes on. And he's like, oh, if I go put clothes on, it's over. I'm not going <laughs> to. Uh, but just that the first time I ever saw that movie, I, that, even though I knew it was an R-rated comedy, I was not ready for dong. And it, it made it very funny. Well, and apparently, also, he had to chub up for that scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, because he said, he said, "I didn't want to. I didn't want to go out like with with my flaccid penis." So like, there's a there's a sensitive so, area. So he had to he had to chub up slightly. Not the full not mass. The full not, not full mass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. Um, yeah, because yeah, we wanted it to look good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Wouldn't you? Uh, well, yeah. <sighs> and then I also wanted to uh, come back to MacGruber <laughs> when the painting, where the got that naked old lady, he's painting, and he's like spritz, and the guy next to the other is like spritzing her boobs <laughs> with water, so it'd be a little shinier. <laughs> oh, one more, one more. Uh, the airplane has funny female yes. as well. Um, the, especially, like, the first one where it's just randomly, she, like, a girl just comes in jug- all jiggling and everything. But the second one where the, where he's in the bed and he's drawing this, like, he's drawing something like a, a, a it's, it's complete, I don't can't remember what the painting is of, but there's a woman posing nude that he's not drawing at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for forgetting Sarah Marshall was that what I was going to say. Sorry. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, I'll just go with Simpsons nudity. Anytime there's oh. nudity in The Simpsons, I think it's hilarious. Well, especially <laughs> in the movie where there's that, that blonde, yeah. big blonde yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> I've, actually, <laughs> I've actually got a... Um... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what is the he says, uh, what is he? He says something. Well, he's like in the middle of the prayer and he says, something penis. Yes, penis. And then the, <laughs> the, and the little kids are like... Bountiful uh, penis. Bountiful penis. <laughs> <laughs> no shit, I've got a Michael Sarah one. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is the end. Okay. I don't know how much nudity, I think it's more female nudity than his nudity, but there is a scene in This is the End where he's playing Michael Sarah as an asshole, which we've kind of made him out to yeah, be today, yeah. unfortunately. But um, um, what? who's the main guy in This is the End playing Jay himself? Jay Baruchel. Jay Baruchel. 
walks upstairs to like go to the bathroom or whatever, and then he walks in the bathroom and Michael Sarah is standing there getting blown by one girl <laughs> and his ass eaten out by the other <laughs> one. And the best thing about it though is he's got this like I think he's got like a drink. Right? It's a lollipop. And he's like, yeah, oh, it's oh, a oh, lollipop. Oh, I thought he was slurping on a straw, oh, it's something. It's something like that. <laughs> And he, he, it, or a sippy cup, was that what it was? <laughs> sippy cup. And, and I can't even remember. Yeah, that's right. And I, I can't even remember what. Come on in. Yeah, he's like, come on in. Just come on in. He's like, I wanted to use so the bathroom. Funny. And he's like, oh, go ahead, it's fine. <laughs> um, and then also, there's something about Mary when he's when he's spying on Cameron Diaz. I think it's Matt Dillon when he's spying on Cameron Diaz. And she's about to take her top off, and then he, the binoculars get knocked away. And then when he puts them back up, it's the older lady with like the suntan chick. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah. What's up, guys? Uh, <laughs> no, Dan no. from Missouri ish. Uh, All right. Thanks for uh, putting this together and having us. Yeah. Here. Thanks for yeah. coming. Thank you. Uh, so, I don't uh, respect the Star Wars prequels, <laughs> and uh, my head canon has the uh, Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon film as the only Star Wars prequel. Mm. You swap out the uh, Jade Sword with a lightsaber. <coughs> Great uh, Jedi history. Mm. That's what I would want. So in that vein, if that makes sense, what kind of like existing film would you reskin into a popular franchise mm. and sort of see how that uh, might evolve or, or change both the franchise and the original film? Hmm. All right. By the way, head cannon is what uh, Sterling K. Brown died of in The Predator. Oh, there you go. That's so right. There you go. Um, all right. Do have, does anybody have anybody made? I have to think about this one. Okay. So we're recontextualizing one movie to be in the canon of the other franchise, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Hmm. I think there's a pretty easy... I mean, I think if you stick with The Rock, you can slide half of his movies into the Fast and Furious franchise <laughs> like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Skyscraper. Or Snitch. Or literally any of them. Is there is there a movie out there that could replace Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions? Ooh, interesting. Hmm. Well... Replace. I mean, they could. They certainly wouldn't be part of the same story. But I think you could put a movie like Dark City in there. Ooh, Dark City. Playing with the same kind of themes, at least. Yeah. But I don't know about replacing. But I don't know. There are other movies about well, Tron Legacy. Is kind of about plugging in and going to a digital world. Yeah. Ex Machina could be a prequel for a lot of that stuff because because the AI. that's yeah that's the mark of the singularity, right? And then every other AI movie, Terminator. Or, uh, or or Matrix or anything like that, where war against the machines, that's the jumping off point, right? It's the that's the machine. point of, of no return. So that could slide in easily as a prequel to the Matrix or to, to Terminator. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, God, I love that movie. I want to watch uh, that movie right now. Yeah. yeah. What, what else is? Uh, what else would you say fits under that parameter? Like, I mean, I don't think anybody really likes The Hobbit all that much, but there's not much. You, there's not many movies out there that you can replace it with. Um, Aragon. Yeah, Aragon. <laughs> uh, um, you guys, you guys have any not, not right off the top of my head. No. I mean. <laughs> This actually, this wasn't something I came up with. I heard this somewhere else, and I think I mentioned it on the the Halloween uh, podcast episode of the Modern Horror Guys, but somebody brought up the idea of a Purge movie with the Predators coming down on Purge night. (laughs) And in that same vein, I mean, you could just throw in whoever you want, like have Jason Voorhees show up on Purge night, or or just whoever it is. A couple years ago, I thought about the Gremlins being on on the Purge. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. There's a lot you could do. I, I just think the Purge. There's so much you could do with that franchise, and everything they've done is not good. But I think there's so much you could do with it. In the same vein as Total Recall and all that, Strange Days, which is it's not a um, now Strange Days isn't a perfect movie, but that's another movie that I will watch if it's if it's on. It's one of those it's one of those very watchable like forgotten. Yeah, uh, movies, and so I think Strange Days would probably go in there somehow too. Mm-hmm. And Catherine, paycheck, can we, can big paycheck. Though, right? yes. <laughs> can we can uh, can we recontextualize signs as a part of the Mars Attacks universe? Oh my God! Can we? That'd be awesome. We could do that. Yes. Uh, that movie sucks, right? Mars yep. Attacks. Yep. I don't yeah. like it. But I can. A lot of people though. like it. My it's wife. Got, that's one of my wife's got, favorite it's got movies. Some funny moments. 
Yeah, it's, it's but it's not a good movie. Suck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's exactly what he just said. What's that? It's a, a watchable, watchable kind of suck. suck. Yeah, yeah. Which you know. Is I like the um, I like the the black exploitation stuff in it though. I love uh, I love like um, Jim, Brown. Kind of Jim Brown. Jim and Brown. And yeah, Pam I like Greer. Pam Grier. I like that stuff. I also like um, uh, is it not Wayne Newton? It's Tom Jones. Tom Jones mm-hmm. is in it. Yeah, singing the. It's it's not unusual, and yeah. the birds are coming in his hands, and you know, you know coming to his hands, movie? not actually coming in his. You hands. know who else is in that movie? Ray, Ray J is in that. Yeah, movie. Ray J. <laughs> yeah, you can call me Ray. It's, you can call me. Yes. Yeah. No, but that it's was the, the second where, most famous video. He's I been remember. Yes, yeah. exactly. I remember the trailer for that movie was awesome. Yeah, oh, and yeah I was, it was so excited because it was the whole bit where. They think they've come in peace, and then they then they shoot everybody. Mm, yeah, and it I mean, was such yeah. a great trailer, and then the movie was just nah. there. There, yeah, there are moments in that where, it's like Jack Nicholson's, like Earth and Mars <laughs> together. You know, like you know, the, all that. The, uh, what was it? Uh, the the one where the alien is like, ah, 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 and, and he's definitely shooting at the guy, and it's like. Stop. We are your friends. We are your friends. Yeah. We come in peace. <laughs> <laughs> and that movie was based on a trading cards, right? Yeah. I think that's yeah. that right. Tops. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Alex in the chat says Shape of Water is a prequel to Hellboy. Oh, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. works. That works. Because, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the David Hyde Pierce uh, character is definitely that same. I mean, it's, 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 it's the same Jones. guy. It's yeah. the same guy, yeah. Doug Jones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doug Jones. Do you want to come up and ask? Um, I'm China. I'm from Michigan, and um, which part? <laughs> Metro Detroit area. Um, I'm not gonna point because I always get it wrong because I suck at geography. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, um, my question is more about how you guys all got from um, "Hey, let's make a video about all the sins in a movie" to here. Like, what were the biggest challenges along the way? What how did you get to the point where you decided that you could quit your day job? Like, um, what was that journey like and, and for you guys? Um, Chris and I started, uh, um, we were both writing for a website called Real SEO. It was about video online and marketing. Um, mostly how to use keywords and titles and links for your video. And sometimes it was about coding or viral videos or what have you. And we just got the bug man we were writing about so many fun creators we decided to start making content and fell flat on our face a few times and then this is the one that the universe decided was gonna hit and so the first sins video we did ended up on the homepage of BuzzFeed that week and so it got about 150,000 views by like the third day that is just unfair like to anyone that's not us, right? Because we we didn't we didn't really earn that as much as the the stars just aligned. But once that hit, we took a pretty hands on approach to like. So I I took that article and went to Wired, found a writer, found her email address, and emailed her directly and said, "We've got a second video coming out next week. We could give it to you exclusively first if you wanted to do an interview." <laughs> And she said yes. And I just bounced that shit for about seven weeks. I went to Forbes, then I went to another site. Uh, and by the time we had done six weeks worth of videos, we had so much coverage. Like, Evergreen, it's going to stay on the internet forever coverage, listing our CinemaSins name, the everything wrong with phrase. <laughs> that Those links are all still out there. And that all helps Google see us as a more worthy thing to put in front of you than the guy over here who doesn't have any articles written about his videos and so then it just kind of I think took on a life of its own from there we kind of stopped hustling if you will for coverage um, and it just kind of snowballed but I was already self-employed trying in vain to be a a video consultant where I would make videos for local businesses I bought a camera, I was shooting video, I don't know shit about shooting video. Um, and uh, so when we started this and it started working and we started getting views and at least according to the back end, we were earning money, um, he kept working for a while, which was the smart thing to do. And we both were putting the same amount of time into the SINs videos. I kept doing my consulting thing too, but it was good, what, five, six months, I think. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I was still working at Hollywood 27, and I was still writing for Real SEO, 
and uh, then um, it was I, I we were making decent enough money to quit jobs uh, like probably February or March or of the 2013. But there's always the idea that it could just be pulled, the, the rug could just be pulled out. So I just kept working all, until the summer. Um, but then I got basically um, the, the theater, the uh, Regal sort of gave me this sort of ultimatum type of thing about the hours I was putting in there because I was putting in 36 hours, maybe a little bit less, but it was full time according to their handbook. They wanted me to work 45 to keep insurance and everything, and I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. Mm. I'm, I'm finally done with this. I'm just, it's the, you know, you just keep on, like, you know, moving the goalposts for me. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was a probably yeah, June or July of 2013. I just decided to quit that, and then I quit Real SEO probably a month later after that, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's been all this since. And, you know... Uh, we're, we're beyond lucky to be able to do what we do without having to go out and get another job. I think if this dried up tomorrow, I would certainly weep a lot. But I wouldn't feel like the universe owed me anymore. Um, uh, we've, we've been extremely fortunate to be in this position, been extremely fortunate to have a core base of fans like, like you guys. I think the core of our fan base out there like you guys, understands that we're joking, that we really do like movies, um, and, um, you know, we didn't, sorry, mm -hmm. um, we didn't, like, put any kind of magic potion together and whip up success. Uh, we definitely failed with three channels we really liked before this. But then um, there, was, there was also consistency, and I think that's, that's what's missing from mm -hmm. a lot of channels and a lot of podcasts, too, is that... From the beginning, you guys were putting out two a week, or it was no, one it was a week one, first. It was one for a while, and then it didn't become two until <laughs> I quit. Yeah, gotcha. And then, but then that's when, once you decided on that format, stuck to it all the time. Same thing with the music video sins, same thing with the TV sins, same thing with the podcast. It passed the, the same time, the same day, every <laughs> week. So I think, yes, there was an element of luck, but I think... And I'm talking about these guys in particular. I think the consistency, you guys tell us, like, is that an attractive thing that you know that there's going to be a new video yes. every yeah. Tuesday and every Absolutely. Thursday? Absolutely. It was for me when I was just a fan, basically. Yeah. So I think that's well, that's well, certainly a of lot of content creators don't do that. And it's right there in the YouTube handbook that consists like create a schedule and stick to it for releases. But a lot of even huge YouTubers, like Shane Dawson's doing that. Uh, conspiracy theory series uh, he's done a couple episodes of he literally drops those whenever he's done and he also did not fuck his cat right yeah. <laughs> uh, you know sometimes it's a week after he said it would be done uh, but it's not the same day and time every week he hasn't set forth a schedule to sort of train you know viewers to become part of that routine part of that family and that maybe, maybe his way is right for that content. I don't know. But certainly on the back end, when we look at the analytics stuff, um, it certainly seems like we we inadvertently chose to do a lot of the right things. Yeah. Uh, uploading the same day and time every every yeah. week. Um, our content isn't hyper-topical in the sense that if you logged into the Young Turks today, great channel, my wife loves them, <laughs> their content tomorrow is not going to matter as much to you as it does today because the news will have changed. Whereas making fun of a movie like an asshole is something I can do any day of the week and doesn't, doesn't depend on what's happening out there in the world. Again, it's not something we set out. Hey, let's pick something that's not based on current events. We yeah. just, we, that was accidentally a perk, but that has also definitely helped us. So I don't know if we answered your question. We certainly talked a whole lot. You know, anything that you guys are willing to share about. Awesome. There are channels out there that can get away with not having uh, a consistent every week schedule but those are some far and above, you know above and beyond type things like epic rap battles mm -hmm. used to do I think 10 episodes or whatever and then they'd leave because those 10 episodes would have 50 to 60 million views yeah. 
And uh, I think they pretty much had their whole year for mm-hmm. those ten videos, which is what an awesome you know, <laughs> life that's got to be, yeah. you know. But uh, but yeah, uh, we, I think yeah, it's the it's all from that YouTube Creator Handbook training. I mean, writing about that type of stuff and knowing that, uh, knowing following that guide was. I mean, we've done most of that. I mean, except for a couple of exceptions, yeah. pretty much everything is that. Well, handled. and even if we ever have an issue for whatever reason of getting something released on time, Jeremy immediately is tweeting, you know, sorry guys, it'll be, you know, we should have it up in a few hours or whatever. We apologize. And I mean, that, I think that's helpful, you know, if people know that you care enough to let them know that it's coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. One of my most embarrassing moments as your friend was we were connecting and doing movie reviews together on YouTube. Uh, and on my channel and I connected with you and I was like have you seen this new everything wrong with video? He's like dude that's my voice <laughs> <laughs> oh I just kind of like blew my mind I very vividly remember because we were on like Skype chat or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was like yeah no that's me like literally <laughs> me like well <laughs> And the other reason I found out was because Barrett texted me. I was on vacation. He's like, hey, you got to check this out. Chris and Jeremy have got these videos. And I'm like, why didn't Chris tell me this? Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't tell people much. Stuff. No, that's true. <laughs> this is true about Chris. So. All right. I'm, I'm Brian from Toronto. I don't know if I'm actually talking. Into hey, welcome. Yeah, you are. Um, okay. Um, I guess my question is, like, what for each of you, what is the one genre that you just, like, no matter how many times you try to get into it, you just cannot? And... I, I feel like it's going to be horror for most of you, but okay, so that's why the, the second part of the question would be, who is an actor, actress, or director who you think could possibly bring you into that genre and kind of change your mind as a fan? I like that question. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, specifically for me, I, I, I don't dig on horror, but I, I, I'm getting better at watching it, and, but the body horror stuff... Oh, I can't do that. I can't do any of that. Yeah. Uh, Cronenberg's no. entire filmography fucks me up. That <laughs> shit, I can't do it. Now, if you were to, if you were to tell me Aronofsky was going to make one after what mm-hmm. I saw him do with Natalie Portman's toes and <laughs> the in the wrestler with all of his wounds and injuries, yeah, this, Aronofsky has a very visceral style, and I think. I, and I'm, I'm very allegiant to him as a film goer. So he might that be might able be to bring me into that yeah. sub genre. That might be kind of cool. Although, you really, you've got to see Mother. You've got to see Mother. Is it the body horror stuff in there? No, not really. No. No. No, not really. No, not really. No. I, mean, I love Mother. I, I think Mother's great. I, like, I love too. Mother, too. Oh, you're talking about the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know who could bring me into to the horror genre is Jordan Peele. I feel Ooh. like if he did some... Hasn't he already done that? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I have a weird I'm sorry. one. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. uh, I don't do documentaries very often, and that's what. The, all right, what the fuck, right? Uh, so, uh, it's not like I don't like documentaries when I see a good one, um, but I just don't go out of my way to to see them. So, it would take something like a like a really really interesting subject. There, there are a few exceptions, especially accessibility, like on Netflix or something like that. There was early on in Netflix's uh, history, there were two um, Queen of Versailles mm. and Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Or Hero or Jiro, I, I think it's Jiro. Um, and those drew me in very, very quickly for whatever reason. Um, but I, it's just not a genre that I keep going back to. So maybe this free solo will like capture my spirit and my imagination and all that it stuff. It was a good year for Docs, man. And I know, really and I know you're not a big true crime person, but have you ever watched Paradise Lost? Have you ever watched any of those? Those are those are very well done. I know. Uh, Just the King of Kong? American movies yeah, one I do love, really I like. love American movie and I okay. love King of Kong. Yeah, King I, of Kong's great. I don't think there's a genre that I don't get into. Um... I there there's only a couple there's like there's one that in particular I think the a lot of the uh, the, the formula has been has been uh, done too many times and it's just I it, it's just it's romantic comedies mm. um, I but I, there's a there's a whole bunch of them that I like it's not like I don't like the genre it's just that it's always the same story every time uh, the guy and the girl don't like each other at first. Then something happens. Usually, the guy shows a, pr- a propensity with kids or something like that, and she, her heart warms towards him. They date. There's some secret he has that breaks them up in the third act, and then they, he 
has the final plea. And that and really the romantic comedy has just been like just like let's just change uh, let's put Ashton Kutcher here and mm-hmm. Brittany Murphy there and well, or Cameron Diaz and then, you know, Mila Kunis and Justin Timberlake. We'll, we just keep <laughs> on doing that. And um and so like there's there's I, I I don't really have a good answer for this question other than that romantic comedies have been worn out mm-hmm. and they just need to change the genre completely for me to be really interested in it. Again. So much so that you didn't really like Crazy Rich Asians, right? Yeah, because I, I thought that was pretty much the same, except, ex, I mean, they didn't, it didn't go that same. They, they were already together. And right, right. The, the only rule, I mean, they still did the whole breakup in the third act. Right, mom like, doesn't like, like you know, uh, don't, uh, yeah, I guess woman, girlfriend, way, or whatever. I guess in a way, crazy they, relatives. Yeah, I guess in a way they did. Crazy they did that exact trope <laughs> about not like, but but this time it was the mom yeah, instead yeah. of the yeah. instead of the actual boyfriend or whatever. But uh, yeah, crazy rich Asians is it, it has a lot of the same stuff that all the other romantic comedies mm-hmm. do. Plus, and plus, we hammered this in the Sins video, but that subplot of the cousin. <laughs> and her yeah, husband. No, what the yeah, fuck was that? I know, I know. And the movie was two hours. Like you couldn't have cut that subplot out, and then made the movie an hour mm-hmm. and a half. Yeah. And and yeah, and then that, that movie also. Remember, we were sitting at a table with Constance Wu uh, yeah. at the Critics' Choice Awards. I yeah. really wanted to like this movie because <laughs> yeah. I like her a lot. Oh, she's but, great. Yeah, but uh, she, and she's great in it. But she, it's the story of of it more than anything. So. Do, you, do you have something other than horror? Or are you going with horror? No, I think uh, yeah, yeah, horror is the only genre that I really can't get into. Um, and and it's interesting because actually, suspense thriller is one of my favorite genres. So it's it's That's weird because they are you know they are cousins, yeah, you know, very close cousins. And uh, but yeah, it's just when it, when it starts to get into. Uh, you know, like, uh, look at that kill. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I just, I just, it does not excite me. So I might be kind of like Chris on this, but I don't like biopics very much. It, it takes, yeah. it takes a very. Oh, I'm such a sucker for biopics. Yeah, there are a few out there, but like stuff like, um, not the, what is Walk Hard making fun of? Oh, well, walk <laughs> walk the line. Yeah, like Walk the Line. Like I, like I don't like that movie. I don't like Ray. I it just, they, they all just. Um, they all just do. The, they do the same thing. It's just like a romantic comedy. It's always like the we're going to pin. Wonderful we're we're going to pin. Yeah, the same wonderful thing. We're going to pinpoint each part of this person's life in like two minutes. We're going to give two minutes to each section, and I don't. It just feels. I don't know. Mm. I mean, formulaic. Yeah, it's very formulaic, it's very, and it, some of them. Some of them try different things, and I'll enjoy it. Uh, Lenny is a great example. Mm-hmm. The Lenny Bruce one that D- Dustin Hoffman did in the seventies. That's a great example of a really good one, but. Uh, yeah, stuff like Walk the Line and, and Ray, and I haven't seen Bohemian Rhapsody, but I'm assuming that. Oh yeah, yep. Uh, I just, Ayo. I just every time, and like this, this, <laughs> this Elton John movie, like I could just care less. Like it might be good, but I just, I just don't care. Yeah. That Elton John movie is a true fantasy, though. It's not a fairy tale. Ooh. Okay. Nice. Well, then yeah. maybe it'll be better. Maybe yeah. it'll be a good maybe one. Maybe it'll be good. <laughs> Once you identify a formula, it's hard. Yeah. It, it's hard to, it's difficult to see that formula and not be bored by it. You mm-hmm. know, when you start seeing the markers and sports movies can be that way. They can. You know, uh, there's a very distinct formula to sports movies that sometimes for me, I can be like, I've seen this before. So, yeah. And even more happen. so with sports movies starring animals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's yes. true. All right, who's our last question? Fucking earbud. Right here. We do have one, one Sinflower online who wants to ask a question. Let's do that. Um, so I'm going to do that first, and then we'll finish with you. So uh, I'm going to say Phonius? Phineas? Ferb? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Uh, wants to ask about Ghostbusters 2020. How does everybody feel about Ghostbusters, the new you know, Ghostbusters coming out? Uh, uh, I... <laughs> All right, that answers that question. Well, uh... You're making a De Niro face. <laughs> It's going to suck. You, you think so? Yes. Yeah. It's going to. Um, the The problem with all these movies that get remade so many years later is that they can't do the same things that they used to do. There's the magic of that first one is always going to trump whatever you see in the in the new one. In the new one, they're just going to. Uh, and. Unless they make something, I don't know. Then maybe they can. Maybe they can make something good. They don't have right? a good track record, right? Like these no. these ones that this even like Super answer. Troopers two and stuff like that that we were talking about recently. They, you can't recapture that magic. This could have been a good answer to what didn't need a sequel. 
I think Ghostbusters is a great example. Well, it already it already has sequels. No, but Sam it didn't need <laughs> one. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I think we would have been perfectly fine. Mm, but then with we would just have, Ghostbusters. We'd be good. We'd be dis- deprived of uh, Peter McNichol and uh, his crazy. Hey. Why am I dripping in goo? I mean, but I mean, I, you know, I I try to take the dicer approach. I want to see the movie, you know, before. But but I mean, I'm not excited about it. You know, there's nothing about it that's exciting me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll definitely watch it. It's hard to put into words what it is. The way films are made are so different. And when you try to make a movie in 2020 that was first made in 1984, there's just something completely... um, It's hard to to put my finger on. It's just... uh, The humor's going to be different. The effects will be different. Mm -hmm. Um... It's uh, it's it's usually just. I mean, usually you've already gone over this territory enough that there's not much left to. Let mind. me ask you this: Did we ever love Ghostbusters because it was about ghosts, or did we love Ghostbusters because of the chemistry of those people working together in the comics? Yeah, I mean, I think I think in the end it's that. I, I well, I, I think I'll take that. I think in the end, I mean, that is one of the best scripts that's just ever been written. I mean, it's it's just a perfect script, and because I mean, a lot of that's not ad libbing. Like that's just that's the fucking script. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that script is taught. Um, I've I've been in many screenplay writing classes in college and stuff where that script was used for so many different examples. Like like it's a bril- It has a it has the most brilliant way of doing exposition. Mm-hmm. Uh, just things you don't even think of. But like the whole the whole uh, where they're in the dining room and you know they're talking about he's explaining crossing the screams. It's just it's brilliant writing. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and obviously the actors yeah play a big huge part in that. But I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, the I, the fact that there's ghosts in there. I mean, I'm sure as a kid, I thought that was cool. That there was monsters, and it was kind of scary. But yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying. It's sort of a, 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 you know, they they made characters with Ghostbusters. Like they made this last one that they came out mm-hmm. with. It, it they felt like I felt like they were hoping that Kristen Wiig and, and Melissa McCarthy and yeah. everybody would make this funnier. Yeah. And they didn't write characters for them. I, no, no, I agree. There's no real character to any of those. Yeah. And, and it, well, and it's weird, too, because, I mean, speaking of Crim Hemsworth being funny, he might end up being the funniest person. He, he ended up kind of being the funniest part yeah, of that movie. Yeah. And that's not good. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he would, but I mean, in a movie where they're supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be the female Ghostbusters and everything, and then this just like had a random weird dude ends up being the funniest person in the yeah. movie that's that's not good for your script yeah isn't he the funniest thing about vacation as well? he, he is <laughs> i've not seen vacation but i can imagine that's yeah. true all right uh, dexter yeah okay well i'm dexter have y'all like what is a movie that y'all have watched and you see all of these influences that kind of just started to fall by the wayside just because it's being it's removed in time hmm Okay. You're talking about the movie that influenced it, or yeah. the, or the film that um, that it it's references. I both. I okay, mean. so there was there was a movie last year, first reformed, mm-hmm. <clears throat> that I think Aaron, you really liked. Yeah, right? I do. Yeah, um, and I kind of liked because have anybody seen this movie before? It's it's an interesting movie. It's not any, it's, it, I don't think it's like anything I've ever seen before because I hadn't seen those movies. But it is almost a direct. I say rip-off, but a direct copy of things like Diary of a Country Priest, of this visual storytelling that um, Paul Schrader came out in interviews and said, I'm literally aping this style just with a slightly different story, a slightly different context of the environmentalism, and a, a slightly different ending. And I, I understand that, and I actually appreciate him being so open about being, you know, influenced and paying homage to it, but I don't want to watch a movie that's a copy of two other, three other movies, and that's that's what we got, and I think that's what was so bothersome about it. Definitely wears its influences on its sleeve, and it's not, it's not, it's still a very good movie. It's just not a movie I want to watch. Anyway, I think the movie that, and I don't know that this is what you're asking, but it's the question I'm going to answer. Uh, <laughs> the the movie that I that I think has suffered the most from influencing so many other movies is The Matrix. I think it is hard to realize now how groundbreaking good, The Matrix was when it came out asking. because it has completely permeated action culture. Um, and that's the one I see that w- you know with younger people who go back and watch it, they'll be like, "Oh yeah, it's a cool movie." And it's like, "No, you don't understand. Like this didn't exist 
before the Matrix. <laughs> You're that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, yeah, so, it's like the it's like Citizen Kane of action filmmaking. Right, like yeah. it completely changed the way those types of movies were made. Well, to sometimes to for the back worst. your point, uh, I remember one of the last years I was at Hollywood Twenty Seven. We were watching that first Matrix trailer. We all got gathered around, and and somebody had not seen the trailer before. And uh, there's all this really cool stuff in it. And and by the end of it, uh, end of that trailer, I just had to remind that person. Now now just remember, you've never seen any of that before. Right. And yeah. Because because when you watch the trailer now, it it doesn't feel like yeah. anything special. And uh, I think that's completely right. Yeah. Well, I think it goes a lot further than that. Like. I'm not an authority, but I have read a couple articles recently about that movie's influence on <clears throat> people in society that are that already want to question their own realities. And you see a lot of this with the scary parts of the internet, I don't even want to say the names of, where they frequently use language like being red pilled or being blue pilled or what have you. And I think there's I think that movie has done a lot to influence culture beyond just filmmaking. Yeah, philosophically. Sure. Philosophically, sure. how we view life, the fact that I jokingly say a lot that we're living in, you know, this computer program and we're going to find out later and none of this is real. I'm joking. There are people that legit believe that. There are scholars who legit think that's possible. Yeah. I think the movie did a lot more than... You're right. It is maybe the most influential action movie, that in Pulp Fiction of the last 25 years. And I don't guess Pulp Fiction's an action movie. I know what you're saying. Pulp Fiction was going to be my answer in the sense that dozens and dozens and dozens of movies tried to ape what Pulp Fiction invented Mm -hmm. instead of trying to invent on top of that. Um, Well, that's the thing, isn't it? The, the, when the, when a movie is copied, they don't really copy everything. They copy certain, uh, I guess surface type of things like Pulp Fiction is that slickness, it's coolness, it's people talking about mundane things, yep. uh, mundane dialogue with visceral violence mm-hmm. paired up together, and that's the lesson they seem to take from Pulp Fiction. Yeah, and instead, and, and instead of looking at all those little things that made a made a big hole out of it, like the they they've just taken surface things and this like that's the movie we make. That's why you got. Thanks to do never when you're dead and, and two days in the valley and all those movies. I was watching a bit of the Mexican the other day with Brad mm-hmm. Pitt. Even that movie feels like it's trying to emulate mm-hmm. Pulp Fiction with the the dialogue and uh. yeah. Well, and and the biggest one of all maybe that that this discussion could talk about Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Uh, Star Wars was one of those where it changed cinema so completely that all the big blockbusters tried to ape what they were doing. And um, and it was and it was really just just copying those surface things of Star Wars, and you forgot that there were characters that you cared about and yep. a story that you cared about. It's like oh, well, let me, oh, I see. People just want these big big spectacles. Mm. Why when Sorry. Uh, when uh, computer animation started with Pixar and all that, people started making their own because oh well, that's what people are going after. They're going after that computer animation. Mm-hmm. It's not the story or anything like that. <laughs> it was some very I mean, Toy Story's movie. animation was. De- I think that was part of its draw because mm-hmm. it was the first major all computer anime. But I mean, that movie's draw was all about the story. I don't think anybody. Yeah. yeah. Well, Split. what's funny about Star Wars is Star Wars is copying Kurosawa. So, yeah. you know, it, I mean, that's just kind of funny to me. And then people started copying that. Even before Star Wars, a couple of years before Star Wars, you get Jaws, uh, you know, changing the way mm-hmm. the summer movie season would go. Um, I've got a couple that we've talked a little bit about horror so i think i'm gonna go with this uh billy wilder's um witness for the prosecution mm-hmm. um have you seen this I so. okay which is um which is based on a play that's adapted from an agatha christie novel or short story um it today like if you watch it today and you've never seen it before you would think it was probably just like a law and order episode because the it literally defined what the courtroom thriller which we talked about earlier mm. too uh, kind of became like it, it that is exactly what it is it's all set up through the courtroom where you know this person gets accused of a crime he hires this lawyer and then you get a bunch of scenes of them in court interviewing you know you know going against witnesses and everything and then there's a huge like twist at the end mm-hmm. you know they 
And uh, but it's it's so good. <laughs> I mean, it's like one of my all time favorite movies. It's so amazing. But I totally get when I when people talk about it now when they watch it and they've never seen it before, they're just like, oh, that just feels like that's kind of like Law and Order or uh, you know any courtroom thriller you can even think of over the last you know fifty years. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but Halloween was the other one I was thinking of, just because Carpenter what the seventy eight Halloween just. I know a lot of people watch that now. Um, I was on Blake's podcast when the new Halloween came out, and he was even talking about this because he had just seen it for the first time. Um, It feels very old, and it feels very uh, unoriginal just because there's been so many movies that have copied it since. And I think what a lot of people don't realize either is that not only did Halloween do a lot for the horror genre because the horror genre was kind of stuck in a rut. It and Texas Chainsaw Massacre probably both did this. It was kind of stuck in a rut. It It was still stuck in, like, the Vincent Price, like, gothic uh, movies and stuff like that and Halloween kind of brought this modernization I guess Rosemary's Baby and Texas Chainsaw kind of did this too but Halloween made it profitable mm. and um, The Exorcist yeah exactly and then Halloween also did a lot for independent film it was the most it was the most successful independent film for the uh, long time Until Blair Witch. was it Blair Witch Blair okay Witch. I, yeah I've heard I've heard Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles some people brought it but how was that not a studio film yeah, but, yeah. it's definitely a studio um, I guess New Line was considered independent at the time but um <laughs> I just think I just think that's an amazing movie, and I think there's just so much going on there that I think a lot of people now, and I completely understand, if you watch that movie today, it's just going to feel like a relic when you've seen you've seen Scream and whatever you've seen that's come after it. Yeah. Um, but uh, and maybe you just maybe you want to appreciate as much what Carpenter did with such a small budget and a small story, and Jamie Lee Curtis. The yeah. o- the other specific thing I think of as far as technique is uh, Hitchcock's Dolly Zoom. Which uh, he used in Vertigo, oh, which yeah. is the idea of you're pulling, you're moving the camera backwards while zooming forwards, and so it creates this effect. And you just, it, it's almost become shorthand, you mm-hmm. know, in cinema for a certain type of feeling, a certain type of emotion, uh, you know, a surprised mm-hmm. fear, or those kind of things. Um, so there are things like that too that filmmakers do that just find their way into just kind of the consciousness of filmmaking. Has any director been copied more than Hitchcock? I mean, he he was definitely a creator. Yeah. So, I mean, and I don't know that he was necessarily the first person ever to do a dolly zoom, but yeah. he was the person who put it in vertigo, and you know, and all of a sudden it became a thing. Well, so. and I think I think Hitchcock he 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 uh, he became like the first uh, like sales pitch kind of director. I mean, I guess you could argue William Castle was doing a smaller version of that, but uh, Hitchcock's just such an interesting dude. Yeah. <laughs> and I Rogers mean, just, and Hammerstein were the first to do the hello dolly zoom. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And on that note. Yes. Yeah, so I was about to say, on that note, uh, that's going to do it for this week. Uh, keep going to Sincast presented by CinemaSins on Facebook, uh, SoundCloud, CinemaSins Twitter, uh, Discord. There are a lot of places to come and talk about this very episode. And if you were a patron on our Patreon page, <clears throat> You could be asking these very questions, like these wonderful people here. Here for Sin Week. It's fantastic. Thank you guys for all your questions. That was really yes, good. Thank you yes. Everybody. Thank you for attending. I know I know that even though that you want to be here and everything, it can feel a little bit long sitting there in the chairs and everything, but I appreciate you guys being attentive and uh, and giving us all these questions and everything. Yeah. So uh, very happy with uh, what I've uh, seen today. Yeah. Uh, but that'll do it for this week. It's Chris Atkinson, Jeremy Scott, Barrett Sher, Jonathan Watkins, and Aaron Dicer. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasins.com. You got to read off everybody else's name, too. <laughs>